software provider, tax cycle in November 2021 as well. In its 2022 financial year results, the company's operating revenue grew by 29% year-on-year to $1.1 billion. The company's core accounting revenue increased by 23%, while platform revenue increased by 113% during the 2022 financial year. The company's EBITDA increased modestly versus the prior year to $212.7 million and reported a net loss of $9.1 million and a free cash flow of $2.1 million. And meanwhile, in Australia, the company reported that its revenue increased by 26% to $483.3 million, with 229,000 net subscriber additions to reach a total of 1.34 million subscribers. And Xero launched the ability for customers to receive e-invoices and expanded its e-invoice sending capabilities for its Australian customers. According to the ASX release, the company said that for the 2023 financial year, it would continue to focus on growing its global small business platform and maintain a preference for reinvesting cash generated subject to investment criteria and market conditions to drive long-term shareholder value. Let's now take a look at its stock performance. So Xero's shares have fallen nearly 8.98% on a monthly basis, while on the six monthly performance, the shares of Xero have decreased as well over 28% as of September 29th. Over the past one year, its share price has fallen nearly 44%. The company has a market capitalization of $11.57 billion with a 52-week range of $72.53 to $156.65 as of September 29th. Well, with that, we've reached the end of the video. Do let us know your thoughts in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Also, press the bell icon and you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Thanks for watching. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calcine. On Wednesday, September 28th, the pound fell more than 1% against the dollar and the euro after the Bank of England announced it would intervene to calm the irrational bond markets in the UK. The pound was expected to experience its greatest monthly decline since October 2008, shortly after Lehman Brothers' downfall. And the bank announced that it would delay the anticipated commencement of its guilt selling program and make the ad hoc Lehman Brothers' downfall. The bank announced that it would delay the anticipated commencement of its guilt selling program and make ad hoc bond purchases. According to the Bank of England statement, it will start purchasing long dated UK government bonds on Wednesday, September 28th, and continue to do so until the market is calm. On Monday, September 26, the pound fell to a historic low of $1.03. The most pressure has been placed on the UK government bonds, with prices falling and yields rising. However, the bank's action on Wednesday seemed to calm the market, if only momentarily. At one point, the yield on the benchmark 30-year gilt decreased by more than 50 basis points. On the contrary, US dollar has been on the rise compared to the sterling pound. And the US dollar reached a new two-decade high last week after the US Federal Reserve increased interest rates by 75 basis points and hinted at significant increases at upcoming meetings. Gains in dollars were minimal because everyone anticipated the US Fed's conclusion. However, analysts said the trend would continue to support the dollar for a while because US rates will be higher for a longer period as reported by Reuters. And according to the Fed's most recent forecasts, its policy rate will increase to 4.4% by year's end before reaching a maximum of 4.6% in 2023 to combat uncomfortably high inflation. Rate reductions are not predicted until 2024 following 
the Fed rate hike, the dollar index climbed to a 20-year high of 111.63 and was last up 0.7% at 110.97. Now coming to the Australian currency and its performance on Wednesday 28th September as fearful traders continue to support the safe haven dollar amid ongoing selling of equities and bonds, the Australian dollar continued to fall to new two-year lows, as reported by Reuters. The Australian dollar dropped 0.6% to reach 64 cents and last traded at 63 cents, its lowest price since May 2020. After a brief uptick overnight, it could not maintain it and ended the session 0.4% lower. There doesn't seem to be any significant support in the offing. The Reserve Bank of Australia is anticipated to raise interest rates by 50 basis points next week due to Australia's strong retail sales numbers. And the markets anticipate a 0.5 percentage point increase to 2.85% on Tuesday and expect rates to reach 4.45% by the middle of next year. If you like this information, please give it a like, share it and comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. But for more articles, head to the website calkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkine Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Hello and good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Calkine TV for the ASX buzzing stocks for the day. Today we'll be zooming into ASX listed stocks in the news on the back of some key announcements. But first, the S&P ASX 200 is lower today, dropping 93.6 points or 1.38 percent. Over the past week, the index has gained 3.29 percent but is still down around 10.42 for the year to date. The ASX All Ordinaries Index is also lower today, dropping 98 points or 1.4 percent. But on the other hand, AVIX is up sharply, getting 0.92 points or 4.9%. And the index has lost around 6.86% over the past week, but it's gained 86.12 over the previous year. All 11 sectors are higher over the last week, along with the S&P ASX 200 index. And although little has changed, consumer staples is today's best performing sector, up around 0.99%. Now to our buzzing stocks. First up, Australian gold and minerals explorer Gold Road Resources has announced a preliminary production and financial update for the September 22 quarter. The company's gold sales totaled around 39,500 ounces at an average price of around $2,380 per ounce. In August, the miner completed the recommended takeover of mineral exploration company DGO Gold. And Gold Road Resources has updated its Guria project, a 50-50 joint venture with Guria Mining Company. The project produced close to 83,600 ounces of gold during the quarter, which was in line with expectations. Now the company has ended the period with cash and equivalents of around $91.4 million and no debt. Shares of Gold Road Resources traded at $1.33. 33 cents, down around 4.31 percent. And then next up, Australian fintech player 
Tyro Payments has updated its key performance metrics for the first quarter of the 2023 financial year and improved guidance. The company has announced a cost reduction program, leading the business to improving its guidance for the 2023 financial year. The program will target an $11 million decrease in its annualized cost base, with $5 million in savings to be realized during the 23 financial year. Tyro will reduce the number of employees as well and cut down on its contractors. There will be reductions in operational and other expenditures too. The company reduced its 2023 financial year operating leverage guidance to a midpoint of 82% compared to the 85% previously. And a bit uh, before share-based payments, expenses expected to be between 28 to $34 million. And shares of Tyro Payments traded at $1.44, down by around 2.69%. Now that is all for this edition of the ASX Buzzing Stocks for the day. Do stay tuned for more episodes coming your way later in the week. Until then, keep it locked on Calkine TV. I'm Holly Shields, signing off. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Calcai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Calcai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. A central banking strategy known as inflation targeting involves modifying the monetary policy to attain a specific yearly inflation rate. The idea behind it is that maintaining price stability by reducing inflation is the greatest way to promote long-term economic growth. Governments work to combat inflation by implementing prudent and long-lasting fiscal and monetary policies. Many carry out their monetary policy by relying on intermediate aims like monetary aggregates or exchange rates due to convenience and experience. Seven small and medium-sized advanced economies have departed from this custom of utilizing such intermediate targets and start to emphasize the inflation rate over the previous 10 years. Central banks have adopted inflation targeting from developed emerging market and developing nations on every continent. Fully fledged inflation targets are nations with institutional procedures to ensure that the central bank is accountable for attaining the target and making an express commitment to meeting a specific inflation rate or range within a particular time frame. According to the International Monetary Fund, Finland, Sweden, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Spain have all embraced inflation targeting in the last 10 years. This innovation was inspired in most of these nations by unsatisfactory experience with maintaining a fixed exchange rate or setting intermediate monetary targets. 
The targets were initially developed by the governments of New Zealand and Canada to aid with deflation. The success of these two nations in containing relatively high inflation encouraged the other five nations where inflation rates were already reasonably low to adopt similar measures. The ability of central banks to respond to shocks to the domestic economy and concentrate on home issues is provided by inflation targeting. Investor uncertainty is reduced by stable inflation, enabling investors to anticipate changes in interest rates and grounds inflation expectations. Inflation targeting also promotes more openness in monetary policy if the aim is made public. Additionally, central banks in more developed economies have adopted many key components of inflation targeting, such as the European Central Bank and the US Federal Reserve, even if they do not use the term officially. These central banks are dedicated to achieving low inflation. Still, some do not announce specific numerical targets, although there are expectations such as the United States, which explicitly adopted an inflation target of 2% in 2012 or have other goals. They've promoted maximum employment and moderate long-term interest rates as reported by IMF in addition to stable prices. Over the last 20 years, many nations have effectively implemented inflation targeting and many more are headed in this direction. Inflation targeting has evolved into a flexible framework that has proven durable in various situations, including the most recent financial crisis. So what do you think about inflation targeting? You can leave a comment below, you can like this video, you can also subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon for our future videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkine. Gambling is one of the most major problems that Australia is dealing with at the moment and it's a major public policy issue. Gambling addiction brings a lot of perils and can often adversely affect the health and well-being of individuals and families. Dependence on gambling, of course, has its own emotional and psychological costs and along with that, it has adverse financial impacts. Did you know that Australia is the world's biggest gambling nation in terms of loss per person? According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare data, about $25 billion was lost on legal forms of gambling in 2018 to 2019 in Australia. Total gambling expenditure losses in the country increased from $22.6 billion in 2001 to 2 to $25 billion in the 2018 to 2019 period. And these figures are undoubtedly huge. The country, however, has seen a shift in betting behavior since the pandemic took over. The coronavirus forced the closure of public venues and hence caused a stir in the trend. According to the Australian Institute of Family Studies data, there was a steep decline overall across 11 gambling activities. From April 2019, before COVID restrictions, to May 2020, which was the key period of restrictions, the numbers have changed. Gambling participation rose to 59% in November of 2020, after restrictions eased in many jurisdictions. According to data from Monash University School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine, losses on poker machines was around $11.4 billion in 2021, shrinking $1.1 billion or 17% from 2019. Still, another set of data from the industry consultancy H2 Gambling Capital highlighted that losses in online sports betting grew $3.2 billion or 80% to $7.1 billion in the same period. This highlights how the addiction was redirected somewhere else. Now, there's no doubt in the fact that the world of online gambling is harder to regulate than traditional gambling. But the Australian government is endeavouring to make a difference. 
What's your take on the gambling crisis? Let us know in the comments below and as always, subscribe to stay updated. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Australia's LNG exporters will now be tripling their financial contribution to the public. According to the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, the companies are forecasted to pay an extra $9 billion to the federal and state governments to help fund public services like schools, hospitals and roads. According to the new preliminary forecast compiled by the association, the gas export sector is estimated to pay around $13 billion during the 22-23 to 23 period. This is a high rise from the $4.8 billion forecast for the last financial year. Now, it's important to note that changing economies and other dynamic factors like foreign currency exchange rates could affect these figures. The top two LNG exporters in the world are Qatar and Australia. Qatar has the largest LNG export capacity in the world, followed by Australia. Qatar's exports account for about 30% of the world's total LNG trade. And Australia is the second largest exporter in the world with an export capacity of about 7.8 million tonnes per year. The country's exports account for around 21% of the world's total LNG trade. Most of Australia's LNG exports are exported from three large plants in Queensland. Gladstone LNG, Curtis LNG and Australia Pacific LNG. These three plants export LNG to customers in Asia, Europe and North America. There are also two smaller plants, the Darwin LNG plant in the Northern Territory and the Northwest Shelf LNG plant in Western Australia. The Darwin plant exports LNG to customers in Japan and South Korea, while the Northwest Shelf plant exports LNG to customers in Japan, South Korea and China. As the world looks to reduce its carbon footprint, Australia is in a unique position as one of the largest producers of LNG in the world. The exports are forecast to multiply in the coming years, and at the same time, the country is keenly committed to reducing its emissions. Major LNG exporters in the country are working to improve the efficiency of their production and export facilities, as well as further investing in research and development to find even cleaner and more efficient ways to use and produce LNG. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe button as well to stay up to date and to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. In this video, we'll go through bear traps and we'll also have a look at the difference between a bear and a bull trap. But before we jump in, do hit that like and subscribe button. So what is a bear trap? A bear trap is a technical pattern that appears when the price action of a stock, index or other financial instrument incorrectly signals a reversal from a downtrend to an uptrend. It's a false technical indication of reversal from a down to up market that can trap investors. This can occur in asset markets like equities, futures, bonds and currencies. The causes of a bear trap are a drop in price below key support level, an investor or trader entering a short position and a drop below the support level is brief and followed by a reversal upwards in price. So how does it work? 
In certain markets, many investors may want to buy shares, but few sellers are willing to accept their offer. In these situations, the buyer might increase the price they're willing to pay for the stock. This is likely to attract more sellers to the market, and the market will rise due to the imbalance between buying and selling pressure. However, when shares are bought, they're automatically pressured to sell them because investors only benefit when they sell. So when too many people buy a stock, it reduces the buying pressure and increases the potential selling pressure. Institutions can also push prices down to boost demand and push up stock prices, making the market appear bearish. This encourages inexperienced investors to sell shares, and after the stock falls, investors return to the market and the stock price rises as demand increases. Bear traps and bull traps are almost similar since they both involve false signals, indicating a trend breakout followed. This is followed by a reversal back to the original trend. And in either of these cases, the investor or trader suffers a short-term loss. Bear traps and bull traps differ in that the direction of the trend and reversal is the opposite. In a bear trap, after a price uptrend, a sudden price break below a key support level will send a false bearish signal, while in a bull trap, after a price downtrend, a sudden price break above a major resistance level will send a signal false bullish signal. Meanwhile, in a bear trap, after a price downtrend, a sudden price break above a major resistance level will send a false bullish signal. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon, stay updated, and boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields, reporting for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Good morning. Thanks for joining us here on Calkine TV for Expert Talks. My name's Sage. Today's guest is Michael Rubinelli. He's the Chief Gaming Officer at Wax Studios. And the games hosted on the Wax blockchain have accounted for close to 42.45% of all GameFi users and more than double that of the next most utilized gaming blockchain, which is Hive, just for some background. So Wax Studios has also recently received a $10 million investment led by the OKX Exchange to further develop the blockchain gaming infrastructure on their blockchain. So this already serves 12 million active users. So here to tell us more about how their ecosystem is growing is their Chief Gaming Officer, Michael Rubinelli at Wax Studios. Thanks so much for joining us, Michael. Sage, lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're totally honored. Um, surely we're going to gain some great insights about this pulsing industry. So can we start off with maybe what the objectives of Wax Studios are? Yeah, look, I think that the thing that we always do is we try to figure out how to take Web3 technology, not necessarily cryptocurrency pricing, right, which a lot of times people get those things conflated. But in reality, the kind of the beauty and the power of Web3 as a platform and it's open, and it's permissionless, is to allow players to own their in-game assets and do with them whatever they want, right? They want to sell them, they want to trade them, they want to give them away, they want to use them, they want to let them sit on the shelf. It's completely up to them. Removing that walled garden 
um, we think is a really, really powerful thing that every player in the world is going to demand sooner rather than later. So we're build, we are building experiences to take advantage of that and allow for that. Yeah, that's making people's dreams come true in a way. It sounds great. So play to earn communities are interactive hubs of connectivity. How do you see these gaming girls influencing the liquidity of Generation X, Y and Z who tend to spend a lot of time on video games these days? Yeah, look, I think the thing that's really challenging for the industry is, you know, adoption. To open a wallet is not easy. To, you know, buy an NFT on a secondary market to put into your wallet is also not necessarily easy to do. I mean, it's not natural. And so the challenge that a lot of these groups, these thought leader groups or these tastemaker groups have to do is they have to convince people that the onboarding is not so scary. It's actually pretty frictionless. At least it is at WAX. Uh, I know not all wallets and, you know, marketplaces kind of function the way the WAX's ecosystem does, but we built a very web to consumer interface, right? So it comes people who come in who are new, they're not intimidated by it. They're not put off by it. There's no friction there. It's like, oh yeah, I'm used to using my single sign on like Facebook connect or Twitter ID or discord ID to auth into something. And now all of a sudden two clicks, you've got a wallet. Oh cool. I've got a wallet. Now I just bought some NFTs. Where are they? Oh, they're in my wallet. Oh great. Oh, now I go play the game. I've got my assets. Yep, you're good to go. Like it's a couple steps and you're kind of off to the races. Now that may seem simple and straightforward, but for the existing audience that is used to downloading a free to play app and then just playing, like that's a lot of extra steps. And it's like, why do I have to do this? I don't understand what that is. And so, like I said, a lot of these tastemakers can, you know, help people on board and help with this kind of mass adoption, right? Really the goal for Wax and for every kind of whether it's a protocol or it's a content studio in Web3 is to really reach out and speak to and resonate with the 3 billion hardcore gamers in the world that we know will drive the, the mass adoption and embracing of this technology. Thank you so much for filling us in there. And what are the main differences between free-to-play and play-to-earn blockchain games? Um, is there regulation so far in regards to classifying blockchain games, you know, M15 plus general audience? Does that sort of thing exist in blockchain games? And you've touched on it a bit, but how do NFTs come into play here as well? Yeah, there's a lot of great questions there, I guess. Let me, let me try to take them one at a time. First, the the notion of opening a wallet is something that we don't want miners to do necessarily, right? And so that's the first thing we have to be clear on is that you are opening something, something and it's commoditized, right? It's a security in a lot of cases. And so we try to avoid it being a security. So we don't speak about it that way. We don't position it that way. We don't ever advertise, you know, here's how this is going to perform. We just make services available and for players to utilize. And so we're, we're very intentional of, with the language we use from a regulation standpoint because we're, we don't think of ourselves as security, but we allow players to kind of buy and sell and drive the value of things that they are setting the price and the demand for and not us. And so that's something we have to be really, really careful about. But the real difference between kind of free-to-play and Web3 gaming is, like we said before, it's ownership. So you come into a free-to-play game, which is kind of a misnomer, like, yes, you can spend no money, but we know that people spend a lot of money and the LTV for free to play games, the really, really popular ones are in the hundreds of dollars. So it's anything but free to play. And what you have at the end of the day when you're done playing your free to play game and you want to leave is you have nothing to show for it. And you had assets that you acquired and you used and they've just depreciated over time. And when you decide to walk away, that's it. But in Web3 gaming, right, you can use the same onboarding funnel. You can come in and you can try something for free and if you like it, you can go ahead and meet, you can make these in-app purchases. The difference is, is you own those purchases now, not the developer. And what you do with them is up to you. And that's this real powerful metaphor to think about it like this in that literally as recently as, you know, kind of, you know, five, 10 years ago, if you sold assets from certain big publisher games on eBay, whether it was a Fortnite skin or it was something in, you know, in a Blizzard product, if they found you out, they would ban your account even though you paid for it, and theoretically you think, well, I bought this, don't I own it? In reality, you're not, you don't own it. You license the right to use it from a developer. And if you try to sell those license rights, which you don't have, you're violating their terms of service, they'll ban your account forever, and they don't care how much money you spent in the, in the game. Like, your account is now dead, and you're locked out, which is really, really sad. What we're actually saying is, look, players want to trade these things. They want to have a secondary market. They want to have value that is either appreciates or depreciates. They want to be able to do with it as they see fit. 
And that's what Web3 really allows for. And so that's really the main difference between kind of free-to-play and Web3 is that interoperability or that kind of dominion over your own assets. It's a really, really powerful thing. And we think that players are going to demand it as soon as they understand just how powerful it is. And, you know, it's really funny that a lot of big publishers are actually trying to obfuscate this from their audience, from their communities. They're saying, oh, NFTs are terrible, and you know, the creation of an NFT is leading to the you know, deforestation of, of the rainforest, or they're boiling the oceans, all these things, and in reality, none of that's true. But they use these fear tactics in a lot of cases, or, or I should say, that's maybe a little bit harsh. I will say that they don't go out of their way to educate their community on the value and the power of the NFT. Right. Thank you so much for sharing your insights there. I mean, a lot of production and manufacturing causes, um, you know, harm to the environment and carbon emissions as well. NFTs can hopefully, or well, the uh, energy intensiveness yeah. of this could hopefully be um, minimised with more renewable energy. That's becoming more prevalent these days. So with an increase in blockchain games from week to week, there's so many more these days. What do you think are the important factors in keeping ahead of the curve for game designers? Well, let me first go back and comment on your comment about kind of the echo friendliness or echo sensitivity of it. Like if you look at the WAX blockchain, we do 25 million transactions a day. And because we're a delegated proof of stake, we're not based on hashing power. Like we're a very echo friendly uh, blockchain. We're the first ever certified carbon neutral blockchain in the world. And you can, I mean, that's kind of no big deal. You can buy a lot of offsets and you can be declared, you know, carbon neutral. But in reality, with those 25 million transactions a day, every single day, transactions meaning updating the ledger, minting NFTs and whatnot, like to run the entire WAX blockchain over the course of a year, we utilize or consume the same amount of energy that five adults do in an American kind of household on average over the course of a year. Like we are so carbon negative, it's not even funny. So again, there's a little bit of a false narrative around kind of, you know, NFTs and blockchains and what have you. And maybe that's certainly true with, uh, you know, mining Bitcoins and you see all these giant Bitcoin farms in kind of Eastern Europe and, and what have you. And But that's not how delegated proof of stake works. And that's not how WAX works. And so we actually welcome people to challenge us on our echo friendliness. And we have all these kind of third party governmental based certifications that, that back up, you know, kind of what we do is a very, very good thing as it relates to our competition. So oh, that, that's amazing. Thank I, you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, a lot of people look, a lot of people don't realize it. And we love to tell the story. And we're actually really proud of it. And we're really, really passionate about the environment. And so we don't sit there and say, oh, you know, a lot, what a lot of companies will do that aren't wax based will say, well, look at credit card transactions. And every time, you know, you know, a credit card transaction tries to get approved, it touches eight different places along this, the chain in terms of approval. And it's, you know, times this many transactions a day, times this many consumers, it's this much energy. And it, it makes Bitcoin mining look like super kind of echo friendly. Like they're just trying to deflect. We actually don't want to deflect. We actually challenge people or we ask people to look at kind of our energy consumption, the amount of the amount of energy it is required to run our chain. But back to your question about um, about game designers and whatnot, mm -hmm. right? There's a real challenge in you drive value for your NFT if you have incredible utility, right? And utility isn't just like, you know, you go back kind of 15 months ago, 18 months ago, it was all about NFTs as collections. And the collections were cool. Look what I've collected. Okay, well, what can you do with it? Oh, I can look at it. Okay, what else? I can show it to people. Okay, what else? I can upgrade it to what? To something that's better looking. Okay, what's the value of that? Well, it's more rare. Okay, well, more rare to who? Well, to me. All right, well, just like, what do you, like, there's, that feels like it's very aesthetic. It is very aesthetic, right? And so the thing that game designers now have been challenged with, okay, great. I've sold these NFTs. They look beautiful. There's a scarcity to them. There's a mint number. There's like the stacking, the pecking order, if you will, in terms of kind of what do you have mint number one or mint number 10 or the last one mint to it. But what do you do with it, right? The utility piece. And so the thing that we tell designers, the thing we focus on is these NFTs that we're minting and putting in our games, whether it's blockchain brawlers or any of the things that we've, we've announced that we're doing, have real value. You use it for things that you want to use it for. And if you have a better version of something, it, melt, it helps you kind of win more often or spend less time engaging in something because you, again, you know, a lot of us don't want to spend eight hours in front of a monitor grinding on something. So, you, you know, NFTs with utility and value and scarcity are something that designers are challenged to utilize. And then how do you now take that construct and put it in a paradigm where there's not just this inflation 
of all these assets. So now there's a million of these things for sale on the market. Well, a million of them for sale, they're worth what, a penny a piece? Yeah, if that. So how do you limit, how do you cap those NFTs so there's great supply and that supply just barely meets that demand and you have that equilibrium? That's amazing because I think the media also plays a big role in the mass adoption of new advanced technologies like blockchain. And at the moment, the media kind of makes it look bad or points it out to be something dangerous that we should be suspicious of until we know more about it. And that's why we're so lucky to speak to people like you who are so transparent and share what's going on and, and what your ideals are and your motivations are. So thanks for sharing your insights with us today. And I, I agree, I think NFTs will have so many use cases in regards to e-commerce and membership and loyalty programs. Everyone loves a good loyalty membership program. But back to gaming, yeah. um, how do you see the integration of machine learning and AI and augmented reality um, impacting blockchain gaming especially? Uh, you know, I'd first love to see it impact non-blockchain gaming, right? Like, I think as a gamer my entire life and a game producer my entire career, that's always been this holy grail, if you will, of interacting with really smart and dynamic NPCs. And the thing that you have to keep in mind is that when you interact with an NPC or, or any kind of object in the world, there's a set of rules or a script that they follow. And there's not this dynamic, wide-open you could have anything you you want, just program kind of a foundational set of guidelines and it'll think on its own. And at the point that that starts to happen and that becomes a reality, like all the games are gonna change. Because what that means is everything that you interact with will be very different from what your best friend did or your guildmate did or whatever. Like, oh, I went up and I had this conversation with them and it was totally about this. Like, wait, I didn't see that or I didn't hear that or I didn't experience that. I did this and they said this or they led me here or I got to do this or I got to try this. I, got, I was like, whoa, how did that happen? Like, it just did because, again, they're living, breathing, thinking sort of entities, right? They're not just this, you know, uh, you know character with a pre-programmed kind of finite set of things that they can do and say. And so once you kind of open that Pandora's box and you crack the code on that and there's AI and machine learning to behaviors, responses and almost kind of emulating emotion, like, you know, that changes everything. And that really starts to blur the lines between kind of, you know, real and fantasy. So it's a super exciting place to think about kind of going to. But real games have to, I think, you have to, have to adopt it first. And we know that they're trying. Um, but, yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's a little bit of ways to go. That's so interesting because, I mean, I've heard of AI writing scripts, writing content for content mm -hmm. creators on social media, but also writing games and, and what you're saying now about the algorithms reading the players' uh, intentions and moves and then sort of uh, emulating them or initiating them. Is, is that what you meant by your comments just then? Yeah, I mean, yeah, imagine if you have a system with really robust artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, what the game can do or, or like the code can do is they, they can look at you as a player, you know, you're this level or this is what you bought or this is what you, this is what, you know, kind of monsters you've beaten or these are the things you've acquired. And it can build a kind of a persona like you do when you look at kind of, uh, you know, demographics of people you try to market to and they can say, oh, this person, likes, they don't like this, they tend to do this, they don't tend to do that. And so then when you have this interaction with what's typically known as an NPC, right, a non-playable character, they all of a sudden, come at you and they're like, hey, you know, we know that you like to do such and such. And it, maybe it creeps some people out because you hear all the time like, wow, Alexa, you know, started laughing when I wasn't even talking to her and that really was bizarre and it's this big brother. But there's that whole slippery slope. But from a gaming standpoint, right, that level of immersion can become super interesting because they now have a preset, you know, uh, kind of sense of who you are and what you like to do. And then they can model exactly where they want to go with that conversation based on what your behaviors and your predilections are. So that all of a sudden, like I said, that opens a Pandora's box. Like, holy cow. Every time I do something, it's different. And that dynamic nature is really what people want. They want something that is open-ended and not never the same thing twice. And I think that's a very real possibility sooner rather than later. Yes, that whole problem-solving thing that keeps us wanting to learn more, which is, which is great. Um, but Watch to Earn is not the only uh, to earn protocol in mm. blockchain now. There's so many others. There's upload to earn, play to earn, ride to earn. There's so much going on. Do you see the development of the metaverse a place where people, people may be able to even walk through various interactive game world portals in the future? 
in, you know, we, we intentionally have stricken the to earn from our vocabulary. It's really dangerous, right? It's really unhealthy and it's not sustainable. And the problem is, is that it's been like this really bright, shiny star that people have latched onto like, oh, I can go make money doing this. It's like, right. But if you're making a lot of money, that means a bunch of people, not just you, but a bunch of people are losing a bunch of money. So it, you have to be really, really careful about the paradigm and how you position it and how you attract people to it. We think ownership and what you do with those assets is really the value and really where we want to educate people. These things to quote unquote to earn, unless you're earning something that is a physical good, right? That I get, like loyalty and affinity, which you talked about. But come in here and play this game and make a lot of money. I mean, that's a fool's errand because what we've seen, and it's been perfectly consistent with every single game that has come out up until this point. And I use the word game loosely. They're really not games, right? They're decentralized, gamification of decentralized finance. And people talk about them as projects. It's like, well, it's a game. No, it's a project. Like, oh, well, then right away you're, 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 you're losing, right? The nomenclature is, like, like I said, very kind of dangerous. And they're not built by game developers or game designers. They're built by opportunists that see this green wave. And so what has happened is you have the same group of people show up to perform the same actions with the same expected outcome uh, and getting the same results. And what that ends up doing or what that has done across every single project, I mean, every single one in the space, is it's created this optimized race to the bottom. And people say, oh, you can continue to scale as long as you keep feeding people into the, into the, into the funnel. But, <laughs> you know, at some point, there's going to be a moment of atonement and reconciliation where, you know, people keep getting in and keep getting in and keep getting in. And because you have this inflationary economy, you know, it's all going to end up cratering at some point. And we've seen it with Axie. We've seen it with every single game because it's not sustainable. And it's a super, super dangerous thing to do. And so when people come in and say, hey, when, you know, when can I get my Lambo? It's like, holy cow, that shouldn't be your motivation. We always say that earning uh, a passive income is a result. It's not a goal. So if you come in and play our games and hang around long enough, You'll have a lot of things in your in your inventory that you can do with as you see fit. If you want to sell them and, and get some money back or get some money out, and maybe it's at profit, great. But that's the result. That's not a goal. And so sometimes that bums people out when we say we don't care how much money you make. We care how much fun you have, right? And we care what kind of friendships you're building within the community, because those are things that are tangible and that last, you know, forever. Not, you know, gosh, I I, I helped you quit your day job. That's not my goal. Yeah. Well, just before you go, when we start winding up the discussion, are you finding there's more uptake from females in the space? Are there girls and women playing your games? You know, it's, it's funny. I'm going to say no, because I just know that there is a ton of women playing free-to-play mobile games and the games on Facebook, social games and whatnot. So uh, I would not say there is an uptick in women playing Web3 games because we haven't figured out how to give them a paradigm that pulls them away from the free-to-play mobile games. And that really is the most important thing, is that as a content creator, I have to give you a better use of your time, right? Like, oh, I'm going to stop playing, you know, Candy Crush or Bubble Witch Saga or whatever game you're playing. I want you to come into the blockchain world because this is a better use of your time. Like, the thing that we tell our audience and game designers and game developers is that we don't want to be thought of as being relatively great. Like, oh, it's great. For a blockchain game like that's a losing you know kind of you know uh, scenario for us right there what we want to be able to say and what we try to say and what we're building towards is hey that's a great game and we never mention blockchain that's a great game and you know you'll have a ton of fun playing it as a really active community it's really easy to transact there's all kinds of cool marketplaces like never once did we say web3 did we say t did we say blockchain we just said this is a great use of your time and you get to own all your stuff it's like oh this is really cool. Wait a minute. Is that Web3? I thought Web3 was terrible. I thought Web3 was the devil. No, that's just what you were maybe you know, taught to believe. But in reality, Web3 is actually great. But we have to find that great gameplay paradigm first. And then we'll go after really aggressively those core gamers, which, you know, about what? 48% are women. It's really incredible how many women play these free-to-play games. And it's an audience that we are very interested in attracting. Thank you so much, Michael, for being available to share your insights with us. We really do appreciate your time. But we'll have Thank to start winding up great. there. Was there anything you'd like to add before Please. we close off? 
No, I just, I, again, I appreciate your show. I've, I've watched you now for the last few months once I heard I was going to be on. I really appreciate what you guys do. It's a, it's a wonderful platform. And uh, Irvit, who you had on a few weeks ago, is a good friend of mine. I thought that was a great conversation from Polygon. He's a, he's a great guy. And so uh, I appreciate you getting the experts on. I, I, I will maybe arrogantly <laughs> include myself in that, in that category because, you know, you've invited me on here. But uh, I do appreciate hearing the insights from the others in the industry. It's very, very it's great for me to hear as well as kind of the masses that you preach to, so appreciate that. Yeah, wow. Thank you so much for advocating what we do. We really do appreciate that, and have a great day. Thanks, Age. And if you just joined us, we had such an inspiring discussion with Michael Rubinelli. He's the Chief Gaming Officer at WEX Studios. Please watch the full interview at Calcai Media's YouTube channel, and keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Calcai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calcon. Australia's largest metropolitan city is all set to ramp up its nightlife. The buzz is coming down as the sun goes down in Sydney. And that's exactly what the city plans to change about itself. Cities and nightlife hasn't been as exciting as other big metropolitans worldwide. According to a recent report by Bloomberg, Sydney has a far smaller nighttime economy than other global cities. Now, the night economy signifies the proportion of in-person transactions made at night. Compared to all the other major cities in the world, like New York and London, Sydney lags majorly behind in terms of night economy. To put things into perspective, let's take a look at the data from payments and technology provider Square. According to the company, people in London make 33% of their in-person transactions between 7pm and 4am, versus just 14% in Sydney. Well, has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the dynamics? It does look like it. Before the pandemic, there was a steady and regular flow of tourists, students and commuters. But with the arrival of COVID-19 came trends like work and study from home and travel restrictions as well, which pretty much changed everything. So it's clear how the city has a lot of catching up to do when it comes to ramping up its nightlife. Now this responsibility of shaking Sydney out of its sleepy reputation has been given to Michael Rodriguez. Rodriguez is the first 24-hour economy commissioner for New South Wales. He has an initial funding of $50 million to fund everything from art installations to live music to make the city more happening and encourage people to get out of the house more often. But will bringing in this change be easy? It's tough to say. Some structural problems need to be overcome first of all. From widening nighttime public transport options to providing people with some important motivation to step out. After two years of the pandemic, will Sydney be able to shed its snoozy reputation? Well, that yet remains to be seen. I'm Holly Shields for Kakai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calcon.
Hi, Sage with you for Calco Media. Please subscribe to the channel. Materials giant Fortescue Metals Group, FMG on the ASX ticker, announced on the 5th of October that Fortescue Future Industries, a green energy subsidiary of FMG, has signed a partnership contract with Tree Energy Solutions. Tree Energy Solutions, also known as TES, is an energy infrastructure developer currently building a green energy hub in Germany. The goal of this strategic alliance between the two companies is to hasten the development of a green energy import plant in Germany. The partnership will combine TES's sustainable business model and access to the European green hydrogen market with FFI's industry leading expertise in creating large-scale renewable energy production. Under the partnership, Fortescue Future Industries will invest 127 million US dollars using its unutilized capital commitment. And this investment will help FFI to draw a clearer roadmap to execute the plan of European transitioning into green energy and clean fuels. Through the agreement Fortescue Future Industries subsidiary, Netherlands Fortescue Future Industries Holdings BV will invest 29 million US dollars to become a shareholder in Tree Energy Solutions BV, as well as invest 98 million US dollars in the construction of the TES terminal in Wilhelmshaven, Germany, and be a major shareholder with a 30% stake in Deutsche Grunges und. Energy Versorgung GmbH, the project company that will build the TES Green Energy Hub in Germany. So both companies have decided to begin this partnership's first phase by jointly developing and investing in the supply of 300,000 tonnes of green hydrogen. The final locations will be agreed upon soon and a financial investment decision is anticipated for some time in 2023. Apart from this, TES estimates receiving its first shipment of green hydrogen at its terminal in Wilhelmshaven, Germany in 2026, where in Australia, Europe and the Middle East as well as Africa will be the primary projects to be focused on during the initial stages of this alliance. TES is determined to develop a portfolio of terminals to enable global transportation of green energy by speeding the import and manufacture of green molecules as a more affordable alternative to fossil fuels. The new strategic partnership underscores FFI and TES's commitment to lowering global emissions. FFI joins a group of investors in TES that includes multinational energy businesses and international financial institutions, including E.ON, HSBC, Unicredit and Zodiac Maritime. Well, with that, we've come to the end of this video. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and press the bell icon for future notifications. I am Sage reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. The expansion of global trade and the increasing integration of global value chains raises questions about how trade and society interact. How does trade affect our society? Is trade liberalization good or bad for us? From the price of household goods to the quantity and quality of work, international trade impacts our everyday life more than you think. In this video, let's have a look at how the global market is impacting you and your family. First off, trade can have both positive and negative effects on the environment. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, economic growth resulting from trade expansion can have obvious direct impacts on the environment by increasing pollution or degrading natural resources. But increased trade, in turn, can support economic growth, development and social welfare, contributing to a greater capacity to manage the environment more effectively. 
International trade can reduce real wages in certain sectors, leading to a loss of wage income for parts of the population. Studies on some developing countries suggest that most households experience increases in net welfare and distributional effects are gradual. Policymakers therefore need to consider the impact on consumer prices when assessing how trade affects households in its roles towards consumers and producers. Another important aspect is that trade is central to ending global poverty. The countries open to international trade tend to grow faster, be more innovative and be more productive, and they provide higher incomes and more opportunities for their people. Free trade benefits low-income households by providing consumers with more affordable goods and services. Integration into the global economy through trade and global value chains can help in boosting economic growth and reduce poverty locally and globally. According to the World Bank, countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia and Indonesia facilitated cross-border trade, made logistics services more reliable and simplified customs clearance procedures. International trade helps in liberating domestic industries and therefore creating a robust economy. Research conducted by the Institute for the Study of Labor states that in the 1980s and early 1990s, many developing countries went through extensive trade liberalization, like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, India and Mexico. Most of these nations observed increases in inequality. Then in developed countries like the US, wage inequality between skilled and unskilled labor has also been increasing. For most developed economies in the 80s and early 90s, increased international trade and rapid technological change occurred simultaneously. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe as well to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calchi Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Australia and a buy now, pay later company called PayRight. Now, PayRight makes things more affordable for customers by spreading the cost of purchases over time. Today, I have with me Miles Redwood. He's the co-founder and joint CEO of PayRight. Thanks for joining me today, Miles. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, firstly, Miles, could you tell us a little more about PayRight? How would you describe its business model and what are the key solutions PayRight provides? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the description you gave is, is pretty close to the mark. You know, we're, we're a, a point of sale consumer lender, which effectively means we give our customers the ability to walk into one of our rapidly growing uh, merchants across both Australia and New Zealand and, and make a purchase today. And, and pay for that purchase over, over time. So it's deferred payment options uh, offered at the point of sale. I'm sure uh, everyone listening in today is, is, is increasingly familiar with, with buy now, pay later as a, as a category and as a, a concept. Obviously, we've seen well, an explosion really in demand for uh, pay over time point of sale services in recent years, but we're very much the first to come to market that specialise in transactions over $1,000. So that's our key point of difference. And what that also means is we have a very distinctly different merchant mix. I think most people know and understand buy now, pay later in the concept or the context, I should say, of retail and retail is an important and rapidly growing vertical for us. But again, being quite considerably higher price, what a very distinctly different offering. Uh, we have merchants outside of that sector in areas like home improvement, photography, uh, education, uh, health and beauty and aftermarket automotive as well. Excellent. And how do you see the buy now, pay later sector developing over the future? 
Oh, I, I see there's still a lot of growth left in the sector. Um, you know, it's still, d despite being a fairly progressed and developed and very much established uh, sector now, it's still very much in its infancy. And we're seeing that with the growth that not just we're continuing to deliver as a business, but all the, the players, particularly, well, in, not only in the micro ticket end of the market, but in this middle ticket end of the market, which is where we, we specialise as well, which again is very much a lot less congested. And I think certainly from the, uh, the end of that market, that middle ticket end of the market, as, I'm descri as I've described it there, with that very distinctly different offering and that very diversified merchant mix, I think there is significant growth still to come, uh, both here in Australia and of course in New Zealand as well. Absolutely. And looking at your financials, during the fourth quarter of financial year 2022, you reached $100 million in gross receivables. How did you achieve those? Yeah, we did. And look, that was obviously a pretty significant milestone for us to hit that $100 million, you know, $100 million mark. That was up 46% uh, compared to, to where we were in, in, in the prior year period. And a lot of that really is off the back of uh, the really good, strong growth and obviously demand we've seen uh, uh, within the loan book across those those uh, quite distinctly different diversified merchant uh, verticals that I described earlier. A lot of the growth throughout the financial year uh, and the calendar year, and we're still seeing that growth into the current current financial year, the current quarter has come from areas like home improvement. Obviously, travel's been a little bit restricted, albeit starting to open up again certainly over the past six months. But prior to of pay right. Now, if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalki Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel Jones reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Hello, I'm James Preston and thanks for tuning in to Cowkind TV for the Daily Crypto Catch. Popular crypto exchange Binance has revealed that Friday's hack, which resulted in more than half a billion dollars being wiped off the platform, wasn't actually stolen from Binance. Rather, it was minted out of thin air thanks to a crucial flaw in the exchange's security system. On Friday, hackers penetrated Binance's exchange allowing them to mint 2 million of the company's decentralized tokens worth a total of 569 million US dollars. Binance was forced to temporarily suspend transactions after detecting an exploit between two blockchains, a particular method of digital theft. In a blog post on Friday, Binance said it was working on fixing any areas of vulnerability. Since then, it's been found that the hackers actually generated more than 500 million US dollars out of thin air, which has consequently flooded the market with Binance's native token, BNB. It seems even the hackers themselves, though, weren't prepared for the windfall of cash they received, with crypto tracing firm Elliptic discovering that the hackers were only able to hold on to 53 million US dollars in Ethereum based tokens. Binance's recent hack is the latest in a string of cyber attacks over the past two years. Moving on now to market news and Bitcoin remained stable from yesterday and was recently trading at just above 19,430 US dollars. Meanwhile, Ethereum grew by just 0.7% in the past 24 hours to trade at 1,324 US dollars. As for today's winners and losers, Terra Classic USD token gained 16.65% in the past 24 hours, whilst Quant Network token grew by 4.77% in the same period. On the losing side of the coin, Hobi token dropped by 2.67% and Toncoin fell by 2.16%. Alright, that's all for this edition of the Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Kalkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. 
Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Hi there, Sage reporting for Calcoin Media. Please subscribe to the channel. The cryptocurrency that was advertised by socialite Kim Kardashian has spiked following the reality star being charged by the SEC for unlawfully touting the token. Ethereum Max, the crypto that was advertised on Kardashian's Instagram page, jumped 124% following news of the star being charged $1.26 million by the corporate regulator. While the number of Emax tokens in circulation is unknown, the total supply of the token is two quadrillion. And despite the token's recent spike, Emax is trading 99% less than the token's all-time high registered back in May 2021. Kardashian wasn't the only celeb to tower to Emax, with boxer Floyd Mayweather and former NBA star Paul Pierce having promoted the token too. Kardashian's infringement has ignited discussion as to whether crypto should be subject to the same regulation as other financial products such as shares or bonds. we reached the end of the video. Please let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon for future notifications. I'm Sage reporting for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Hello, Sage with you again for Kalkai Media. Hope your day is going well. Please subscribe to the channel. Optus on Monday provided updated information regarding the impact of the cyber attack on customers. On the back of extensive ongoing engagement with more than 20 federal, state and territory government agencies, as well as departments, the Australian Telecom has confirmed that nearly 1.2 million customers have had at least one number from a current and valid form of identification and personal information compromised. The company has communicated that these customers and recommended that they take action to change their identification documents. The telecom giant added that around 900,000 customers have had numbers relating to expired IDs, compromised and personal information. The company said that they continue to work with governments and agencies regarding what further steps, if any, those customers should take. And having worked with government agencies to thoroughly examine the data for the company's 9.8 million customers, the telecom giant has confirmed that the exposed information 
did not contain valid or current document ID numbers for some 7.7 .7 million customers. The data included details such as email addresses, date of births and phone numbers. Now, according to the company's statement, it has already sent an email or SMS to customers with current ID documents compromised in the cyber attack. The company has advised that data from their ID documents have been compromised and the next steps they should follow. The telecom giant has also contacted customers whose ID documents had expired to notify them that their ID documents were breached. Meanwhile, Singapore Telecommunications, the parent company of Optus, has announced that Optus is appointing Deloitte with the support of the Singtel board to undertake an independent review of its cybersecurity systems, controls and processes as part of the review. And Deloitte will undertake a forensic assessment of the cyber attack and its circumstances. Deloitte's global specialists will work with the Singtel and Optus teams and other international cyber experts and will continue also to engage with relevant stakeholders. Earlier on September 22nd, the company confirmed that it had instantly stopped the attack and no passwords or financial details were compromised. However, Optus also said that the cyber attack compromised several home addresses driver's licenses and passport numbers. Thank you for joining us on that important report. With that, we've reached the end of the video. Please do let us know your thoughts in the comments section. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. And please press the bell icon to be notified of future videos. Sage here reporting for Calkai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. One of the oldest industries in the world, the gold and silver mining industry is also one of the largest, with a wide section of workers from small scale miners to large scale mining operations. And when it comes to delving into and exploring the stocks from the industry, there are a few things that you should keep in mind. Let's discover these extensively. The first one is the prices of these metals. The price of gold and silver can be volatile, so it's important to watch the markets closely. Gold prices have a direct impact on the profitability of gold and silver mining companies. When gold prices are high, these companies can bag large profits from the operations and of course, this in turn would lead to higher stock prices for the companies. On the contrary, however, when gold prices are low, these companies are bound to witness a decline in profits leading to a dip in stock prices. On the contrary, however, when gold prices are low, these companies are bound to witness a decline in profits leading to a dip in stock prices. Recently, gold prices have been gaining limelight. This has come amidst the concern that the US Fed reserves might unfold an aggressive plan to handle high inflation. Australian gold stocks, meanwhile, are part of the material sector, which has surged quite impressively over the past few trading sessions. And in one year, it's gained around 8.4%. In short, these factors are bound to influence the price of stocks. Moving ahead, there are different types of gold and silver mines as in there are junior mining companies and major mining companies. So it's important to research each one carefully. Junior miners are small-scale operations-oriented companies that explore new deposits of minerals or metals. These businesses can be a little riskier when it comes to investments as opposed to the major mining companies. But at the same time, they can offer some surprising elements. 
The major miners, on the other hand, are large, established operations orientated. These companies can be less risky as their mining projects are often proven with mineralization. So prioritizing your interests and making your choice is extremely important here. And all in all, it's crucial to note that various other factors like production costs and reserves can also affect a company's stock, which is why it's extremely important to understand these before exploring silver and gold stocks. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe as well to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkai Media. I'm Sage. Today's special guest is Pamela Komonos. She's the founder and CEO of Komonos Family Lawyers. Now, for some background, family law is an incredibly significant sector of the law, covering housing, land titles, alimony, and child support payments, as well as the severance of joint contracts and custody issues. It's especially important as it deals not only with the articles and ten A's of legislature, but also with people's relationships, futures and lives. Especially when there are children involved, it's important to handle family law matters in a professional and thoughtful manner. Here to share her insights about working in this space is Pamela Komonos. Welcome to the show, Pamela. Thank you so much, Sage. How are you? Oh, I'm well, thank you, and I can't wait to get started because I don't think you can ever be too prepared for this type of life event, and it is a life event. I don't think it's, um, you know, it's up there with marriage. It's up, you know, divorce is one of the hardest things that people can come up against in life. Mm. Um, so if you don't mind, can we begin with what your main objectives are for running your business, the law firm? Okay, so the, the business has been around for the last 12 years or so, and the main objective has always been client care. So it's very much very, it's very focused on clients. And we understand that when our clients come to us, it is one of the most vulnerable times in their lives. Divorce, as you've indicated, is a life changing event. So we take that very seriously. So when our clients come to us, it's very much a very, a very empathetic approach, a very supportive approach and a very reassuring one. Often they're navigating the law for the very, very first time and it's often, it's in an unhappy event for them. So we're, we take a very client-focused approach, if you like. Thank you, Pamela. So how important for you as the business owner and being a female business owner in this space, mm -hmm. how important is it for you to align your brand image to the inner workings and mechanics of your corporate strategy, please? So our, our brand image and, and inner corporate strategy, strategy 
is very much aligned. I can't see the two not being aligned. Brand, the brand image is all about, as I said, a caring, empathetic, do no harm philosophy. And again, everything we do in house, we we work towards meeting those goals. So the the, the practice is very, has a very clear vision, and, and the clear vision is that we see it, we envision envision a world where people separate with care, respect, and dignity. And everything we do within the practice is all about minimising harm, always thinking about the best interests of children particularly, and looking at solutions that avoid people having to go into more conflict, which is often the case when you need to go to litigation, for example. So we're always looking for all solutions that assist our clients to resolve their matters as amicably and quickly as they possibly can. Thank you. Now, just aside from our main discussion, if I can just ask this, just because you've inspired me with your answer, you mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you want to, you know, come to mediation as amicably as possible. Do you ever find that people might prefer to represent themselves and maybe even try to outwit the lawyers in in this case? <laughs> <laughs> People don't naturally want to represent themselves. It's not it's not a thing that they want to want to do necessarily. Often they're limited because there's cost issues are involved or it's quite protracted litigation. Uh, my personal experience and my professional experience, if you representing yourself is quite it has a lot of um, danger. The word danger is quite strong, but it has a lot of pitfalls. And it's like me. I'm not an expert say, for example, in dentistry, so I wouldn't ever dare to start doing any kind of cavity work in my mouth. So in, in very similar ways, it's the law is very technical. It's for people who really understand and there's a lot of experience in that. So representing yourself often may seem like an attractive way of saving money and costs, etc. But in the long run, it actually can be quite quite hurtful and quite harmful and have other opportunity costs that you may not be able to see initially. Very true. So I hope you that answered things. your question. The long we did one. Perfect. Thank you so much. You. So you. moving on now, how important is community building and having a digital presence like mm. for your business mm. to be successful? Mm, very good question. Traditionally lawyers don't have much of an affinity with the social media world or not much connection with with i suppose having a digital presence but i've always been a little bit different i think it's very important to speak openly about what you stand for and have a visible presence in the community and that's been my absolute focus along with of course the running the business and the care of our clients and the care of our team as well in-house but it has very much been about being in the public eye and building mutually respectful relationships as I work in this in this very, very challenging industry. Yes, I think there's been a lot more pressure on businesses to offer some form of transparency or to talk about their processes and what they're hoping to achieve uh, mm -hmm. instead of just setting goals and not really stating why they're setting those goals or how they're setting out to achieve those goals. So it's really interesting to see this new age where everyone's getting 15 minutes of corporate fame in these type of interviews and things like that. And thank you for agreeing to share your insights today. Um, we don't talk to many lawyers, so... Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm I want to break, I guess in some ways it'd be great to break that mold because lawyers are human and they can be very creative and they can have lots of ideas and yeah, we're not, there's a stereotype of lawyers, I guess, in some ways that they're pretty reg regimented and rigid. That's not necessarily the case. That's great to know. I like mm. to see that people with such high status levels as lawyers also as approachable because sometimes it can be quite intimidating to try and express your feelings to people who have such you know, high IQs and who know so much. So, Well, thanks for th saying that. It's very kind. There are a lot of people <laughs> in the world who've got very high IQs. Um, the profession, it, we, the way I've been practicing for many, many years is really about being accessible and it's really just being ordinary and just being one of the clients in many, many ways because the philosophy that I have is I put myself in the client's shoes and I often say, well, if I wanted to be represented or if I needed a lawyer, what sort of lawyer would I want? 
And that's the first question that I always think before I sit down and have a conversation with a client. So it's great. very, it's very client centric. Yeah. Yes. Great ethos to have. So what is the most important thing to keep in mind when regarding, uh, sorry, when talking about houses and finances, especially um, when going through a divorce? Another very good question, Sage. Thank you. For me, divorce connotes or conjures up a lot of emotion for people. Yeah. So there's a lot of pain and a lot of emotion and maybe there's, there's some level of uh, upset, distress, maybe even some level of vindictiveness and not being able to let go. And I know it's another very harsh word, but I think if you really want to be clever about it, you want to, you, you need to start thinking from the perspective of, of it being a commercial decision. So we look at everything from, even though we we understand that people are going through a life changing transition and an event, we take the approach of being commercially minded at all times. So we, we look at things from the perspective of rational rather than emotional. And again, you know, maybe that's, that's what people are paying me for, essentially, not to be that emotional person, but rather to be rational, calm and considered and give them the best commercial outcomes possible. So that's, that's the philosophy that we, that we adopt and approach. And it, it, again, it's, it's not a win, it's not a loser or winner kind of situation, to be honest. It's, here you are, it's difficult, there are losses, how do we make the most of what we have right now? You're exactly right. I mean, when people are feeling emotional and the tensions are rising, don't always make the best decisions for yourself or maybe decisions you may regret in the future. So no, I, agree. I, think, I agree. Yeah, you, yeah. And, and that's what I, I see myself as a trusted advisor, someone who people come to to trust that I have the knowledge and the experience to navigate and support them through this very difficult time, but also not, I don't, I try and keep a distance because that's my role is to be, be quite clear and reassuring, but also I don't want to use the word unemotional because that, that makes me sound like I'm unempathetic and I'm not unempathetic. Mm. However, not to allow the emotions to take over the commercial reality of the situation. That must be such high level skills you have there to be able to blend in being empathetic as well as keeping abreast of the lateral decision making process on what's best for both parties. Amazing. Um, do you have any insights on how you can prepare yourself for these type of discussions just before we wind up the discussion? In terms of discussions going through a separation, telling spouses, what's, what's the, I'm, not, I'm unclear a bit of the question. Um, how you prepare yourself for mediation with couples. Okay, so I'm a lawyer and my role is to represent an individual so I wouldn't represent a couple at mediation. Right. All right. So essentially what we do is that we, we, we have a philosophy again of do no harm but also setting up our client for success. So we spend a good few hours with the client way prior to the, any mediation and we look at all the ways that we can have a win-win solution. And win-win doesn't always mean that we walk away with everything we have. Often it could mean that we make concessions, okay? So we have a, we have a reality check, I guess, with our clients to prepare them so they can really understand what's involved in this process. Great, thanks so much. So what can we expect from Commonwealth Family Lawyers? What's in the pipeline? A lot, actually. It's a pretty dynamic business that I'm running and I'm really excited about it. For me, from, from our perspective, it's continuing doing the good work for our clients, of course. It's continuing building a really healthy and harmonious, harmonious and cohesive culture. And that's something that's really, really important to me. We see our, our family, we see our team as a family. Just we've got a very much a family flavour to it, if you like. The other thing that our business is looking to do is bring change our pricing because one of the things that we've been talking about is that this hourly rate is, can be a real problem for clients, especially when they're uncertain about costs. So we're looking at providing fixed fee services. And finally, what we're looking to do is provide additional services on either end. So if you're in that situation where you're not sure whether you should stay or leave a relationship, we're looking at providing some service, services to support you. And then following the divorce journey when it's all done and dusted, how do we rebuild our lives? So they're the two, they're the kind of, they're the things that we're looking at at CFL. Wow, sounds amazing. Best of luck with that. And thank, thank you, you so much really for joining us today. It.
Yeah, we really do appreciate your insights. So okay, if you just, you. yeah, have a great day. All right. Now, if you just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Pamela Komenos. She's the CEO and founder of Komenos Family Lawyers. Please watch the full interview via Calkine Media's YouTube channel. And this is Sage reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. The Reserve Bank of Australia increased the cash rate target by 25 basis points to 2.6% earlier this week. This resulted in homeowners paying hundreds of dollars extra on their mortgages. After the RBA's move, Australia's big four lenders, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, National Australia Bank, Westpac Banking and Australia and New Zealand Banking Group also raised their home loan rates. The Combank lifted its home loan variable interest rates by 0.25% each year from October the 14th. The bank also increased the interest rates across several of its savings products, with its 12-month term deposit up by 1.35% to 3.35% per annum. Earlier in September, the NAB increased several savings rates by 0.5% and term deposit rates by up to 0.85%. The Australian New Zealand Banking Group lifted its variable interest rates for its home loan customers and savings rate for the ANZ Plus Save account. They said they would increase the variable interest rates across its Australian home loans by 0.25% per annum from Friday the 14th of October. Westpac Banking also announced interest rate changes with a range of interest rate changes for deposit and home loan customers effective from October the 18th. The lender said that home loan variable interest rates would be increased by 0.25% per year for new and existing customers. RBA Governor Philip Lowe says the RBA has been committed to returning inflation to the 2-3% to range over time. This latest increase from the RBA marks the sixth interest rate rise by them since May, taking interest rates from record low levels of 0.1% to the current rate of 2.6%. Are interest rates hurting you? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and press the bell notification for our upcoming videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. Hi, this is Sage for Calkai Media. In this video, we'll take a look at the share price performance of the three ASX 50 consumer stocks in September. First on the list is West Farmers. Shares of West Farmers were quoted at 46 Australian dollars 69 cents per share on the 1st of September 2022, and on 30th September it closed at 42 Australian dollars 72 cents apiece. 
In September, West Farmer's share price recorded a fall of almost 8%. The company shared no price sensitive news during September. However, back in August 2022, the company shared its full year results for the financial year 2022. So during the year, the revenue increased by 8.5% in earnings before interest and tax declined 3.8%. Net profit after tax, including significant items, fell by 1.2% and operating cash flows dropped 32%. The company announced the full year a dividend of $1.80 Australian per share, 1.1% up from the previous year. Next on the list is Coles Group. As of the 1st of September 2022, Coles's share price was 17 Australian dollars 77 cents apiece. By the end of the month, the shares were quoted at 16 Australian dollars, 43 cents per share. In September, Coles share price shed nearly 7.5%. On the 21st of September 22, the company announced that it inked a building agreement with Viva Energy Group to sell its convenience and retail business to Viva. And under the deal, Viva would operate 710 Coles Express sites. With the execution of the acquisition, the current fuel and convenience alliance between the parties would terminate. It was due to end in 2029. Coles said that under the agreement, customers of Coles would continue to get loyalty benefits. And the company expects to close the transaction by the second half of financial year 23. Coles would receive sale proceeds of close to 300 million Australian dollars and would assign leases related to Coles Express to Viva on the completion of a transaction. And lastly for you, Woolworths Group. Woolworths share price was quoted at 36 Australian dollars, 42 cents per share as of the 1st of September, 2022. By the 30th of September, 2022, the share price had dropped down to 33 Australian dollars, 95 cents. So within a month, the share price recorded a fall of 6.78%. In September, the company provided a few updates regarding the acquisition of circa 80% of share capital, my deal for consideration of one Australian dollar, five cents per share. My Deal is an online marketplace for those who don't know in Australia that offers more than six million products. The acquisition is expected to increase the Woolworths marketplace capabilities in bulky goods and homewares. On the 6th of September, My Deal shared that shareholders have voted in favour of the scheme. On the 13th of September, My Deal updated that approval had been received from the Supreme Court of New South Wales. And the next day, the company said that the scheme had become officially effective. Well, with that, we've come to the end of this video. Thanks for joining us on that one. Do share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and also press the bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. A Turkish-born American economist, Nuri El Rabuni, recently highlighted that the great moderation had given way to the great stagflation, which will be characterized by instability and a confluence of slow motion negative supply shocks. The US and global equities are already back in a bear market and the scale of the crisis that awaits has not yet been fully priced. Rubini claims that the increase in inflation would be persistent that its causes include not only policies but also negative supply shocks and that central bank's attempt to fight it would cause a hard economic landing. Recently, the Reserve Bank of Australia lifted interest rates by 25 basis points or 0.25%, resulting in homeowners paying hundreds of dollars extra on their mortgages. RBA Governor Philip Lowe acknowledged that interest rates are unwelcome, but insisted they were necessary for taming the current high inflation levels. 
The Economist had warned about recession and its effects of widespread financial distress and debt crises. Notwithstanding their hawkish talk, central bankers caught in a debt trap and they still wimp out and settle for above target inflation. Any portfolio of risky equities and less risky fixed income bonds will lose money on the bonds owing to higher inflation and inflation expectations, stated Rubini. Inflation and its accompanying interest rate hikes generally are not good for tech stocks because these stocks are often looked at as growth stocks. The situation is a double whammy for the sector because inflation may increase the cost of debt and rising interest rates can impact future cash flows negatively. For example, the S&P ASX All Technology Index has been down 31.95% in the past year. The persistent negative supply shocks have contributed to inflation. The European Central Bank, the Bank of England and the United States Federal Reserve have begun to acknowledge that a soft landing will be difficult to pull off. Fed Chair Jerome Powell now speaks of a softish landing with at least some pain. Meanwhile, a hard landing scenario is becoming the consensus among market analysts, economists and investors. Rubini also believes that it is much harder to achieve a soft landing under stagflationary negative supply shocks than when the economy is overheating because of excessive demand. Now, if you like this information, please give it a like, share it and comment below. Subscribe to the channel by pressing the bell icon. You'll be notified every time there's a new video released. And thank you very much for your time watching. We also have a website. Do check it out. It's calkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. The sharp rise in interest rates in the current year has jolted stock markets worldwide while the term interest rate is put to use in different domains including the cost of borrowing, return on investments and savings. It is primarily known for the rate charged by central banks on its loans and advances to commercial banks. The possibility of shooting inflation could make the interest rates go even higher. However, it is important to note that this spurt in the interest rate could drastically affect stocks in various sectors. While focusing on the technology index, which has been down on a year-to-date basis by 31.19%. This data was current on the 6th of October. Let's now discover in depth how interest rates are bound to influence technology stocks. The impact of interest rates on technology stocks is both important and a little complex. The rise in interest rates may negatively impact the profitability and share price of debt heavy companies or companies with high fixed costs. And when it comes to tech stocks, there's a high chance that they'll drop. There are a few reasons tech stocks may drop when interest rates rise. And one of the most important reasons is that the rise in interest rates could make it tough for companies to borrow money for expansion since it becomes too pricey. And this can negatively impact the smaller companies and startups that may not have the revenue to cover the increased costs. Tech companies are majorly about experimenting and expanding and if that process gets hindered the stocks are bound to be negatively affected. Furthermore companies that strongly depend on consumer spending may also be impacted negatively. Higher interest rates could make consumers cut back on spending posing a problem. On the contrary though, some technology companies may benefit from higher interest rates if they have significant cash reserves or generate a large amount of revenue from exports. Now, 
If we take a closer look on the flip side, one way that technology companies can benefit from higher interest rates is by issuing bonds. And now when the interest rates have surged, bonds get pricier. Technology companies can use this to their advantage by issuing bonds that could be used to finance new projects or expand their businesses. Thanks for joining us. Now, if you like that information, give it a like, share it, comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, please, and by pressing the bell icon, you'll be notified as the new videos come out from Kalkine. There's also a website, do check it out. It's updated regularly. It's kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkine Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on untraceable events. With me today is Tracy Leparulo, founder and CEO from Untraceable Events. Welcome, Tracy. Great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now, first off, Tracy, we'd love to hear more about Untraceable. What can you tell us about the company? Absolutely. Uh, I've been part of crypto since 2012. Uh, when I went to Kenya and I started a microfinance program there. Uh, so very early on, I got involved in the Canadian crypto community here in Toronto, where Ethereum started out of. And so what Untraceable does is we build community. We've been running events and marketing activations around the world for the last almost a decade now in the crypto space. Uh, and we focus primarily on large scale events and, and how to engage people of all audiences to get involved in cryptocurrency and really bring blockchain technology to, to real life. So you mentioned there you started quite early out within your interest in crypto. So from that, where did the idea for Untraceable come from? You know, it was a natural progression with how it kind of happened. Uh, I got very fortunate because Ethereum started in Toronto. Uh, so I got very early on in the Ethereum project and got hired by the, the founders of Ethereum to help them launch. Uh, and that's really kind of the birth of Untraceable. So we ran the largest event at the time. It was 800 people. Uh, and now our events go up to almost 10,000 people uh, here in Canada. And so um, it's really just been an evolution of bringing the community together uh, with, of course, uh, with the just, you know, multiple you know, bull markets helping to grow this community as well. And I believe Untraceable held the first Bitcoin Expo in Canada. What can you tell me about that? Absolutely. So this was back in 2014. Um, like I mentioned, we uh, Ethereum was the title sponsor there. So we launched them at that event. Um, we also ran one of the first Ethereum hackathons at the time. But it's so interesting to see how the community has changed since 2014. It was definitely much more of a social entrepreneur, libertarian movement. Uh, the focus was really just Bitcoin um, with the first time people kind of heard of what's blockchain technology beyond Bitcoin. And that's where Vitalik came out and explained Ethereum for the first time. And um, ever since then, you know, it's just been a really big growth in the whole sector. And it's been amazing to see how much it's grown uh, to our most recent conference, Futures Conference, uh, which was last week at around 6,000 people. And how important do you feel it is to run the hackathons? It is so important, especially in things like a downturn market right now, uh, to have things like hackathons. So if you know what a hackathon is, is we bring developers and engineers together from all around the world to build technology and compete on prizes. Uh, and so we have sponsors and companies that come in with real world problems they're trying to solve, techno focus on specifically the technology, 
and we connected to developers that could actually build these solutions. A lot of, I've been doing hackathons since, since uh, the early days and a lot of big projects have come out of some of the events that I've run. A perfect example was in 2017, CryptoKitties, one of the first most famous NFT projects came out of a hackathon that I ran. And so it's important to bring these communities together, to bring these developers together. They cross-pollinate skill sets. They, they, they usually around 72 hours, they stay up all night long. Uh, and they get to work on these technologies that are actually going to drive our industry and innovation forward. Um, and so, you know, the hackathons in specifically um, are so important to the industry to build community, to build the engineers, and to real get real world applications that ideally uh, become real real projects in the space. It sounds absolutely fabulous and such an exciting space to be in. Um, looking towards the future, what future plans do you have for Untraceable? So what we did at this last event is we gamified the full experience. We provided codes and points associated with doing everything on site. Uh, and so what we did is we brought block blockchain to real life to gamify an experience on site to drive real world actions. So if you can imagine, you would get points in cryptocurrency if you went to sponsor booths, if you went to speaker sessions, if you recycled at the event. And so what we're really excited about is how do we bring and change real life actions using token, token economics, using a cryptocurrency to incentivize people to change their habits on site. You know, it's been a rough year, a rough few years for anyone in the event space in COVID because of COVID-19. And it was so incredible to see the turnout. And what we're really trying to do is bring technology to real life to continue engagement, to continue and foster innovation and to just to get people connected more and more. It absolutely seems like an area that is just set to grow and grow. Thank you so much for your time today, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And that was Tracy Lavarulo, founder and CEO from Untraceable Events. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calchi Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel Jones reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calchine. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Calchine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calchine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calchine Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calchine. Can rising mortgage rates and a mellow housing market impact a company's performance, particularly in providing home improvement products and building materials? Well, it does look like that. We're talking about none other than Home Depot, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The company is a leading provider of home improvement products and building materials. The firm was incorporated in Delaware in 1978 and it is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia and it provides over 35,000 home improvement products through a retail chain store network. Home Depot operates through more than 2,000 stores across North America and is reportedly one of the largest retailers in the country. The business manufactures various items as well and apart from an extensive network of physical stores across the US, the company also operates and sells its products online. Looking at Home Depot's performance, the company's shares have been down on a year-to-date basis by around 29% and yearly the shares were down around 12%. Although, on a daily basis, its shares shut in the green territory on October 5th with a slight rise of 0.10% and then they were priced at around $289. According to the company's statements, its financial performance witnessed a surge back when the pandemic was at its peak. 
And with people spending more time at home and taking up renovation products, Home Depot sales surged, jumping 19.9% in the financial year 2020 and 14.4% in financial year 21. Home Depot generates most of its sales from its operations in the US, although the company has a strong foothold in Canada and Mexico as well. And in the current market, where the mortgage rates are racing up to a level they haven't been in 15 years, the company's business is operating at a resistance level, according to the company. In the second quarter of financial year 22, Home Depot's revenue reached $43.8 billion. That being said, it will be interesting to monitor the company's performance in the upcoming days and see how well it defies the odds in the market. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe as well to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Bitcoin trading has surged in popularity in recent years, but it's not without its downside risks. The value of the world's oldest cryptocurrency can change at a fast pace. Last year, carmaker Tesla's decision to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment immediately sent the price soaring. However, it did fall sharply when Tesla CEO Elon Musk announced a sudden reversal of this policy due to concerns about Bitcoin mining's adverse effects on the environment. Crypto mining has always enticed both individuals and businesses. And one of the reasons is that crypto mining is usually considered a safer bet compared to trading. The miner gets a BTC token after partaking in the process of recording transactions on Bitcoin's blockchain. This means it's a reward or payment for the work done, not any profit that arises from a buy and sell activity. Let's now explore Bitcoin mining in more detail and learn whether it's legal in Australia. As we know, Bitcoin and its alternatives like Ether, also dubbed altcoins, are blockchain-based assets which are also viewed as digital currencies. Blockchain, a distributed ledger, is at the heart of the entire arrangement and there must be regular work done to keep it updated. A Bitcoin miner or any other crypto miner does this work, often called validation. The process adds new records to Bitcoin's ledger and new BTC tokens are also created to be handed over to the miner as a reward for the time and labor expended. The entire process is about adding a new block to the blockchain, which is what validators or miners do. However, since a BTC token is very costly, reaching around 68,000 US dollars in November of 2021, many miners compete and make the mining process more complex. Today, this involves the use of overly sophisticated computers that are said to consume a very large amount of electricity to carry out complex Bitcoin mining. And the cost of the hardware used is estimated to be very high as well. So is mining legal in Australia? In short, the answer is yes. And the Australian Taxation Office has expressly used this term in its explanation of the treatment of cryptocurrencies for taxation purposes. The ATO has stated that when a cryptocurrency is held, including in the mining business, it's treated as a trading stock. Notably, costs involved in the acquisition process are deductible expenses, and when the acquired Bitcoin is sold, the proceeds are treated as ordinary income. Now to sum it up, Bitcoin mining is not viewed favorably in many countries, especially China and Turkey. And one of the reasons is that the process is very energy intensive. The other is that Bitcoin is often considered a threat to the traditional financial world, and its price volatility can lead to heavy losses to the investor. Many countries, including Australia, are yet to regulate Bitcoin and altcoins in a well-defined manner. But for now, Australia has not objected to Bitcoin mining, and there are businesses that undertake institutional mining of cryptocurrencies in the country. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe button as well to boost your financial IQ and stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calkine Media.
The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kelkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Hi, Sage here for Kalkai Media. Thanks for joining us. Please subscribe to the channel. Is demand for oil increasing or decreasing amid the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries and allies? Cuts to production. Let's take a look in this video. On the 6th of October 2022, the Brent crude oil price stood at $92.91 US compared to $87.33 for West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. And meanwhile, the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries basket price stood at $94.05. US That was current on the 5th of October. Europe's Brent crude oil, the US WTI crude oil and the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries basket are three of the most important benchmarks used by traders as references for oil and gasoline prices. In March 2022, due to the Russia-Ukraine war, oil prices rose to their highest level since 2008. The decline since August reflects market uncertainty over the looming global recession and recently the 45th meeting of the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee and the 33rd OPEC and non-OPEC ministerial meeting took place in Vienna, Austria. In the meeting, the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies agreed to steep oil production cuts, curbing supply in an already tight market, causing one of its biggest clashes with the West, as the US administration called the surprise decision short-sighted. Considering the uncertainty that surrounds the global economic and oil market outlooks and the need to enhance the long-term guidance for the oil market, and in line with the successful approach of being proactive and preemptive, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies or OPEC plus decided to adjust downward the overall production by 2 million barrels per day from November 2022. And according to a statement from the United States National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and National Economic Council Director Brian Deese, the US President was disappointed by the short-sighted decision by OPEC Plus to cut production quotas while the global economy is dealing with the continued negative impact of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. The statement also said that at a time when maintaining a global supply of energy is of paramount importance, this decision would have the most negative impact on lower and middle income countries that are already reeling from elevated energy prices. And according to the International Energy Agency September 2022 oil market report, world oil production rose 790,000 barrels per day in August to 101.3 million barrels per day. The strong recovery in Libya and smaller gains from Saudi Arabia and the UAE offset by losses in Nigeria, Kazakhstan and Russia. The report also states that from August through December, growth is forecast to slow, edging up by just 280,000 barrels per day to 101.6 million barrels per day. 
Meanwhile, all eyes would be on International Energy Agency's October oil market report, which is set to be released on October 13. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic caused crude oil prices to fall sharply as demand for oil collapsed following lockdowns and travel restrictions, according to Statista. In early March, the initial outlook and uncertainty during the pandemic led to disagreements between the two biggest oil producers, Russia and Saudi Arabia. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. Thank you very much for your company. Do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And keep watching Calkine TV. Hit the subscribe button as well as the bell icon and you'll be notified every time there's a new video. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage from Kalkine Media. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks here on Kalkine TV. In this episode, I'll be sitting down with Victoria Costa, the CEO of Credifix. Victoria, great to have you here with us today. Hi, thank you, James. Well, Victoria, first and foremost, what does Credifix do? What do we do? What have we done? I think is probably a better answer. In the last eight years, we've helped thousands of Australian families to fix and improve their credit reports so they in turn can get on with their wealth creation journey. So in fact, over the last eight years, we've probably inadvertently written thousands more home loans and got families out of the rental market and into being a homeowner. Yeah, it's a very important thing, especially when you consider how bad the housing crisis is at the moment. I know I'm personally saving for a house. Mm -hmm. Might never come at the rate things are going at the moment, that's for sure. But I want to take you back to those eight years ago. Why did you decide to create Credit Fix? Was there something that struck you and you were like, I need to, I need to help out here? What was it? Oh, definitely, for sure. I've always been in the finance industry. I've been in the finance game for 20 years now, so pretty much showing my age. But I was always in the mortgage processing side of things. And then I went through a divorce and I was a single mum and I understood how credit repair worked and I struggled myself to remove a default from my credit report. And then when I looked at the credit repair market, there were so many credit repair companies, but they were all charging up front. Now, credit repair is never guaranteed and I didn't like that. And although I thought, you know, I'd be good at this, you know, I'd be great for, you know, at advocating on behalf of people. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I do credit repair? I'll just start a small business. I was just based in a little housing commission unit in uh, Paramassa in Western Sydney. And I thought mm. I'll just serve some local finance brokers and say, hey, listen, I can help you with your credit repair needs for your clients, but your clients will only pay if I'm successful. And Credit Fix Solutions was born. No, I think it's a brilliant concept. I mean, we, we look at that in the legal profession, of course, at the moment, where it's a, for a lot of those different firms, it's a case of no win, no fee. So it's, um, it's, it's great that you can actually put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and it's proof within the pudding. Uh, just before I let you go, are there more people getting into bad financial positions these days, or is it kind of still uh, an issue that seems to be, I suppose, the same as it was, say, 10 to 20 years ago? All I can say is that over the years I've been doing this, most of our clients have gone through difficult times. So divorce, illness, death of a loved one. It's not that they're bad people, they've just been through bad times. Although there are those that do just accumulate debt, but then circumstances change. According to Equifax, one in three people have bad credit in Australia. So this is affecting a lot, lot of people. And what we're seeing since COVID is that that number has increased um, natural disasters, economic impacts, loss of work. Uh, many, many people have been affected um, by all of this whole situation we've been through the last couple of years. 
Yeah, it's certainly been a pretty tumultuous period between floods, fires, and of course, as you mentioned, the pandemic. So it's been a lot to contend with, that is for sure. Uh, just before I let you go, where can we find you on social media? Do you have Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Yeah, look, we're everywhere. LinkedIn, you can find me, Victoria Costa, on LinkedIn, and also our website, creditfixsolutions.com.au. Brilliant. Well, Victoria, thank you so much for your time today, and hopefully we can chat more in depth in future. Thanks, James. Thank you. Well, that's Victoria Costa, the CEO of Credit Fix, and if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, so make sure to subscribe. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkine Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Sports cards are usually trading cards and one of the earliest forms of collectibles. They usually contain a picture of the player on one side with statistics or other data on the back. Trading cards or collectible cards date back to 1886 when Goodwin Tobacco, that's an owner of several cigarette brands, introduced a baseball card set with 12 players from the New York Giants. A sports card hobby can be started with just a dollar or two. The main objective is to collect the favorite team or player whose value can increase. Many past cards are now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. According to the verified market research company, the sports trading card market size was valued at $7.88 billion in 2021 and is projected to reach $20.48 billion by 2030. That's growing at a compound annual growth rate of 9.01% from 2023 to 2030. According to the report, the global sports trading card market experienced strong growth due to significant technological advances in the sports trading card field. Certain sports leagues are constantly taking place and have up to five trading card licensees. The four major sports leagues are the Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, the National Football League and the National Hockey League. They signed exclusive trading card deals with just one card manufacturer. The NBA and the National Football League's current card partner is Panini America, while Upper Deck has the license for the National Hockey League and tops for Major League Baseball. So would you be interested in collecting sports cards? You can let us know in the comment section below. You can like and subscribe this video. You can also press the bell notification for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Inflation refers to the increase in the price of most goods and services for daily or general purposes, such as food, clothing, transport, housing, and much more. Economically, inflation refers to a long-term increase in the prices of those goods and services, leading to a devaluation of the currency and a decrease in the purchasing power of the national currency. 
It's measured as the rate of exchange in these prices. And prices usually go up over time, but they can also fall in a situation called deflation. The most famous inflation indicator is the Consumer Price Index, which measures the percentage change in the price of goods and services consumed by households. In Australia, the Consumer Price Index is calculated by the Australian Bureau of Statistics and is published once a quarter. The ABS collects the prices for thousands of items to calculate the CPI, which is grouped into 87 categories and 11 groups. Every quarter, the ABS calculates the price changes of each item from the previous quarter and aggregates them to work out the inflation rate for the entire consumer price index basket. Prices are gathered from various sources like retailers, supermarkets, department stores and household shopping websites. The ABS also gathers rates from government agencies, energy providers and real estate agents. And for certain items, it has access to data that permits it to record prices frequently. According to the RBA, the Australian Bureau of Statistics collects nearly 100,000 prices each quarter. And in picking which goods and services to include in the Consumer Price Index basket and their weights, the ABS uses information about how much and on what households in Australia spend their income. If households spend more of their income on one item, that item will have a larger weight in the CPI. Measuring inflation is deemed vital as it's believed to be a key economic indicator that helps to determine an average citizen's financial health. What's more, central banks use this data to formulate their policy rates. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe button as well to stay up to date and to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. The Asian Development Bank has again cut its economic growth forecast in developing Asia and the Pacific amid increasing challenges. These include rising monetary tightening by central banks, the impact of Russia's prolonged invasion of Ukraine, and repeated lockdowns due to COVID-19 in the People's Republic of China. According to Asian Development Outlook 2022, the region's economy is now forecasted to grow 4.3% this year. The growth forecast for next year has been cut to 4.9%, while the region's inflation forecast has been increased. Apart from China, the rest of emerging Asia is expected to grow by 5.3% in 2022 and 2023. The report also mentions that consumer spending and domestic investment have been boosting growth as economies in the region continue to ease pandemic limitations. 
However, the ongoing invasion of Ukraine has intensified global uncertainty, deteriorated supply disruptions, and unsettled energy and food markets. Additionally, aggressive monetary tightening by the US Fed and the European Central Bank is damaging global demand and shaking the financial markets. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 outburst and new lockdowns have decelerated growth in China, which is believed to be the region's biggest economy. According to a report by the Asian Development Bank, economic growth in China is likely to be moderate to 3.3% this year due to those restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic and slightly higher consumer demand. China's economy is forecast to grow 4.5% in 2023. The world's major developed economies are estimated to grow 1.9% in 2022 and 1% 1 in 2023, which is slower than estimated earlier this year. High inflation has urged the US and Europe to aggressively tighten monetary policy by reducing demand in these countries, which also remains impacted by supply chain disruptions and uncertainty from the invasion of Ukraine. On the other hand, the Asian Development Bank has also lowered its 2022 economic growth outlook for India due to sluggish global demand and tightening monetary policy to manage inflationary pressures from higher prices for oil and other commodities. Its forecast growth of 7% for the 2022 fiscal year ending 31st of March 2023, while growth outlook for 2023 is also revised down to 7.2%. Well, that's the end of this video. What do you think? You can leave your comments below. You can also like this video and subscribe to our channel. And you can also press the bell notification button for our other upcoming videos. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kelkai Media's CryptoBuzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. I'm Rachel Jones for Calchi Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on trading game. The best way to do that is to sit down with founder Chris Tate. Hello, Chris. How are you today? I'm good. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Great to have a chat with you today. Now, firstly, Chris, we'd love to hear more about what trading game is. I think if we were to put it in a nutshell, simple sentence, the role of trading game is to return control to investors and traders. We run a trading and investing mentor program that's been running for 23 years now. And if it's one thing the pandemic has shown us is that people don't have as much control over their lives as they thought. And I'm not talking about the global macro things like a pandemic. I'm talking about whether the business they work for will still be in existence at the end of the week. I'm talking about whether they'll have a job. So we aim to try and return control to the individual with regard to their own financial well-being. And you've also written books on trading. Where did the inspiration for this come from? I, I'd I would like to say that it came as a flash of inspiration. Uh, it didn't really. My first book came about as a result of a simple tap on the shoulder from a publisher I knew whilst I was happily ensconced in a dealing desk at the Bank of Singapore, who'd seen some of my lectures on derivatives trading and said, there's no derivatives of books in Australia, would you like to write one? And I thought, well, I've got nothing else to do for the next month, I might as well. 
And what is your advice about the ongoing volatility in the global stock market? Why are we seeing this volatility right now? I think it's one of these things where we have to be a little bit careful about what we mean by volatility. Volatility is simply how far, how quickly have prices moved. We look at that over various time frames and compare it to other time frames, and we make a judgment as to whether markets are more or less volatile. One of the problems we have, though, is that people immediately assume that because the market has gone down, it's more volatile. The current volatility in both our market and the US is around about its average, both short-term, medium-term and long-term volatility. The market is actually quite stable, despite the fact that it's going down in the US and we're drifting down. The, the perception of volatility, though, I think comes about because people are being buffeted by news such as inflation, interest rates, cost of living, all those things. They tend to build this narrative that very, very much unsettles people. And that unsettling means that they can't take a step back, can't actually look at the market and go, well, it isn't actually that volatile. It is simply going through one of those periods where instead of trending up, it's trending down. And with that, what do you expect to see in the future for trading gain? Uh, I, for us, we will simply continue to run our mentoring program. The, the program itself is designed to function across every market, every time frame, every instrument. So our people are not really phased by this, uh, simply because they have the ability, they've learned how to short markets, they've learned how to trade FX, they've learned how to trade commodities. So these periods, if anything, present opportunity. And, and whenever a market moves, it presents opportunity. It's just actually realising what that opportunity is. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time there, Chris. Thank you very much. And that was Chris Tate from Trading Game. If you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calkine Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. You an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. Whilst the wider crypto market has been in decline over the past seven days, one token has bucked the trend. Algo, the native token of the Algorand blockchain, has experienced strong gains recently after hiring a new chief marketing officer last week. The company behind the self-styled sustainable blockchain announced that it had hired Michelle Quintagli, who joins Algorand's new interim CEO, Sean Ford, after the firm's previous CEO, Stephen Kokonos, left the position in July. Quintagli has served at some of the world's top companies, including positions as head of communications at both Visa and Fidelity, and also the head of global media relations and public affairs at Raytheon Technologies. Algorand's value has reacted positively to Quintagli's appointment, with the token jumping from 31.5 US cents to 37.25 US cents on Monday afternoon, an increase of around 15%. In fact, Algo managed to nudge above 40 cents on Saturday before a slight correction. Algorand is a self-sustaining blockchain supporting a wide range of applications. Founded by Silvio Micali, Algorand was developed to speed up transactions and improve efficiency in response to the slow transaction times of other blockchains such as Bitcoin. Moreover, much like Ethereum's new system, Algorand runs off a proof-of-stake mining protocol, meaning it requires significantly less electricity than proof-of-work protocols such as Bitcoin. So what's your take on Algorand? 
do you think its rally can continue? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and share the video. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Hello and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Kalkai Media. Let's zoom into three ASX listed supermarket stocks that have soared more than 25% over the past five years. But before we do that, hit the like button and subscribe as well. First on our list is Coles Group, which is an ASX listed supermarket specialist. The company has grown from a variety store to a full-fledged retail company, which is engaged in the distribution of consumer products, including fresh food, groceries, household goods, lick-out fuel and financial services through its store network and online platforms. The company recently announced that it has entered into a binding agreement to sell its fuel and convenience retailing business to Viva Energy Group. The transaction will see Viva Energy own and operate the 710 Coles Express sites, which Coles currently operates. Over the past five years, the business's shares have gained nearly 29% and in the past one year, Coles shares have gained nearly 0.84%. The company stands with a market cap of around $22.2 billion as of the 27th of September. Next on our list is Woolworths Group. In its 2022 financial results, Woolworths reported a nearly a flat yearly profit. The company reported a 9.2% surge in group sales and 39% increase in e-commerce sales. Despite this, Woolworths said that the full year results were impacted by product shortages, supply chain disruptions and regional flooding, as well as team absenteeism. Over the past half decade, the company's shares have gained nearly 61% and in the past year, Woolies shares have declined about 9%. The company stands with a market cap of $42.12 billion as of the 27th of September. And last on the list is Medcash a wholesale marketing and distribution company in the consumer staples sector. By providing merchandising, marketing and operational support across their food, liquor and hardware pillars, the group tries to be the best store in town. Although competition from Woolworths and Coles keeps Metcash on a challenging framework in the supermarket segment. During the 2022 financial year, the company's group revenue increased by 6.4%, while group EBIT increased as well by 17.7%. Similarly, Metcash reported a record group revenue of $17.4 billion Aussie dollars during the 2022 financial year. 
And over the past five years, its shares have gained nearly 55%. And in the past one year, Metcalf's shares have gained around 4%. The company stands with a market cap of $3.86 billion as of the 27th of September. Now that you're up to speed, share your thoughts in the comments below and hit that bell icon to stay updated with the regular info. Holly Shields here reporting for Calpine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. The traditional CEO position is being supplanted by more specialised leadership positions like Chief Data Officer or Technology Officer in the rapidly expanding data and artificial intelligence sector. The metaverse has recently gained a lot of attention. While the idea is still in its infancy, major internet firms like Meta and Roblox have already started offering customers experiences in this digital reflection of reality. And considering recent events, it's no surprise that the C-suite will be adopting the Chief Metaverse Officer position to grow in importance. The requirement for experience and specialization in managing the Metaverse and its products has increased in interest in the Chief Metaverse Officer position. Luxury fashion companies have jumped headfirst into Metaverse partnerships, exhibitions and fashion shows. Large IT firms compete with them for the top programmers to create their Metaverse platforms. Several organizations are looking for specialized metaverse related positions, including Nike, Amazon, Meta, Balenciaga, KPMG, and even Disney. However, while businesses employ engineers to work on virtual reality, they would need a CEO to oversee it. Because of this, experts have predicted that the chief metaverse officer position will become more common. In some instances, the position has a direct connection to the metaverse, as in the case of an Amazon job listing for a senior product manager. Technical, AWS Game Tech, which reads, this role will own the delivery of cloud-based metaverse services and requires a combination of strategic thinking, business problem solving, building technology and stakeholder management. The ideal candidate will have experience working with businesses that develop 3D video games, 3D digital twins or metaverse technology and they will also have a proven track record of delivering results at scale with material impact on the bottom line while navigating ambiguity and juggling several stakeholders. The topic of how leadership will form arises because businesses employ an increasing number of professionals focusing on the metaverse. The need and role of Chief Metaverse Officer or CMTO will likely occur during the following few years. So if you like this information, please give it a like, share it and comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon. You'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. But for more articles, head to the website kalkinemedia.com. Say cheer for Kalkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. 
Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine Media. Today's guest is Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder of Clooster. With the Ethereum merge scheduled for September, we're all looking for more insight into what's going to happen to the crypto space after this major event. In a volatile market, investors are keen to find guidance on direction of trades and cryptos to invest in, and it's important to do thorough research in market fundamentals and economic factors that could impact the markets. So as much information and insight we can gain into the space from experts will only help us in our own search for the best investments that we can find. So today's expert, Griffin Trelaw, is specialised in crypto analysis and will share insights from his business, Krista. Welcome to the show, Griffin. Hi, Saves. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure being here. Oh, thank you so much. Um, what are you noticing, if we can jump straight in? I know you're probably really busy. What are you noticing in the changes that are occurring leading up to the merge of ETH 2.0? It's been talked about for so long. Do you think things like gas fees should be decreasing after it happens and maybe the use of more layer two scaling solutions? That's a fantastic question and I agree with you. Yes, gas fees in theory after this upgrade uh, should theoretically decrease. However, the, the merge is simply just a consensus change from proof of work to proof of stake. For, for the viewers who, uh, who don't know what that means, uh, proof of work uses miners or a hash rate to validate chief consensus, whereas the proof of stake mechanism refers to the process of staking the native tokens of the network used as collateral by staking operators to achieve consensus. Now, roll-ups uh, essentially assist this scaling by compressing transactions into a single transaction and then posting that onto a layer one. I'm going to get a little more technical here, so please bear with me. Uh, after EIP4844, now EIP is an acronym for ETH Improvement Proposal, that essentially is to make the cost of roll-ups cheaper by making it less expensive to post proofs on the layer one. We have two brilliant articles on roll-ups uh, posted on Substack by Cluster Research that I'll happily post after this stream. Now, um, two examples of roll-ups are StarkNet and Optimism. StarkNet is a zero-knowledge roll-up that uses zero-knowledge proofs to compress these transactions, whereas Optimism is an optimistic roll-up that also uses fraud proofs to compress transactions. So, in theory, uh, gas fees will not really lower post-merge. This is actually a common misconception. The fees will be lowered through upcoming hard forks after the merge, which is going to allow for these hard forks to occur. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that's definitely clarified something for us. Now, you've inspired me with that. Has Ethereum ever had to transfer the maximum amount of transactions it's able to so far? Or is it still just theoretically a number that they've suggested that they're able to cope with on the blockchain at any one time? So Ethereum in its current state is doing more transactional volume than Visa itself. And that is while it's still using proof of work. As we scale to proof of stake and this merge occurs, in theory with upcoming hard forks, it's theoretically possible for Ethereum to scale up to 100,000 transactions per second or, or more. Uh, it's also these additional mechanisms that will be introduced such as EIP1559 uh, that will then make Ethereum deflationary. So in theory, the, uh, if more transaction fees are being burnt than the block rewards generated, then the supply of Ethereum will be diminishing over time, therefore making it more and more scarce. Now, the purpose of this was to, to make Ethereum more deflationary in times of high network activity. As the merge occurs, it can then handle that network activity 
making the asset a better overall investment as the uh, and as the meme says it is ultrasound money in that sense yeah, ultrasound money. Wow, that's definitely a term that I've heard before, but I've never really understood it. So you believe it's the fact that it's becoming more deflationary and more useful as a mode of transaction. Is, is that correct? Correct, correct. This will all be allowed post-merge, and then as future hard forks are implemented, it will then allow Ethereum to start scaling more, handle more transactional volume and network activity, and then ultimately if... Um, if transaction fees are, are being burnt, it also becomes deflationary too. So it's uh, it's an amazing asset. Uh, look at it like digital oil to, to the older generations that uh, are trying to wrap their head around this. Uh, it is going to power this next sort of digital economy, this financial system that moves online. And I, I honestly believe that Ethereum will be leading this charge. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, and it's not just the older generation who are trying to wrap their head around it. I'm trying to understand what's going <laughs> on here as well, trying to keep up. <laughs> so thank you for that. Now, what do you think will happen to the staked Ethereum that was previously required by the miners to use proof of stake consensus? How do you think this will impact ETH's price? That's a very good question because I was looking into that myself recently. Now, the, the staked Ethereum won't actually be unlocked at the date of the merge, which I believe is intended to be around middle of September, September 15th. Um, the unlocking of the Ethereum will likely be six to 12 months later through a different upgrade. Um, in that sense, that could create some short-term volatility as Ethereum is released back into circulation. Uh, economics does dictate that as the supply increases, the demand should decrease. So um, that just sounds like another opportunity to, uh, to, to look at Ethereum if it does become cheaper and more supply into circulation. However, uh, I don't see that lasting too long before demand picks up again and the, uh, and the price of Ethereum rises with it. Okay, thanks for that. So moving along. What do you see as the main difference between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum? I heard you know, uh, mention hard forks earlier. That's when, if I understand correctly, another blockchain breaks off from a main blockchain such as Bitcoin. If you can clarify that in a moment, that'd be great. And how can people avoid being scammed by other similar sounding protocols such as Ethereum Classic to Ethereum? Okay, um, don't sell yourself short, Sage. You, uh, you know a little more than you think. So a, a hard fork is essentially you're, you're splitting the chain to allow for an upgrade. Now, uh, if we rewind back to the first half of that question, uh, Ethereum Classic, uh, that is the original chain which was forked following the DAO hack. There really isn't a risk of being scammed here. The only real risk is sending Ethereum Classic tokens uh, to an Ethereum address and, and vice versa, right? So. Ethereum Classic still uses a proof of work chain. I don't see that changing anytime soon, which of course will please the miners. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, miners are the one using uh, GPUs to, to, to validate these uh, transactions. It's a consensus mechanism and they then get paid um, uh, Ethereum or, or Ethereum Classic as new blocks are minted. Now, a better question might be why miners are, are forking the proof of work chain so they can still mine Ethereum post-merge. And that's likely so they still have a chain to mine on and don't have to move across to Ethereum Classic altogether. Essentially, after the merge, we'll have three types of Ethereum hard forks. We'll have Ethereum, ETH proof of work, and Ethereum Classic. So uh, if, if you want my expert opinion, I would go with Ethereum because it's the most robust and abundant chain. It has the most activity, it has the most developers, and therefore it makes sense to, uh, sorry, to, to follow the strongest chain moving forward. Wow, thank you very much for clarifying that. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of Ethereum mining rigs that are going to go obsolete. Is that true? Do you have any insights to share on what's going to happen with those rigs? I mean, the, the rigs themselves can always switch to different cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum Classic. Uh, they're going to be keeping Ethereum proof of work as well, so they don't have to ditch the Ethereum chain altogether. There are other coins such as Ravencoin, which you can still mine. I believe that had a halvening uh, a year ago. So miners will still have many, many opportunities to continue mining coins and, um, and validating transactions as far as proof of work goes. Uh, ETH itself, you'll still have the option of, of mining it. However, the token itself will just instead of be called, uh, sorry, instead of being 
titled ETH, E-T-H, uh, it would be E-T-H-P-O-W for proof of work. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um, so back to the mainline discussion. Is it true that Coinbase could halt Ethereum withdrawals the day of the merge? And how will this impact investors, please? Okay, so that's a standard practice with many, many exchanges that, uh, that follow these upgrades. So uh, yes, investors should still be able to trade on Coinbase itself. So the, the impact will be minimal. Like I said, it is a standard practice whenever a coin is doing an upgrade or a, or a rather mar a large upgrade at that. So why they do this is to just reduce the exposure to customers in the case, uh, sorry, in the case of something going wrong. And that way their assets won't get stuck or lost. It's more a preventative measure, if anything. Okay, thanks very much for that. So as we start to wind up the discussion, do you see Ethereum flipping Bitcoin as the largest crypto by marking cap in coming years? And do you have any tips for us on cryptos to keep our eyes on? For sure, for sure. So mm -hmm. uh, another great question. I, I am an ETH maxi. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it goes to say, yes, I do, I do believe that the Ethereum uh, market cap can eventually flip that of Bitcoins. Now, the reason I believe that is because it already has flipped Bitcoin on every other major metric except for price. Now, uh, flipping Bitcoin's market cap will probably happen last. And, and the reason for that is because ETH is always expanding. New protocols are being introduced. The, the innovation itself, network security and, and soon scalability. It's, it is the only cryptocurrency to inherently solve the blockchain trilemma meaning that it's decentralized, secure, and scalable. I, I don't know another cryptocurrency to date that can keep up with that. And um, like I said, it's the network that has the most activity on all fronts. It's the most secure and soon to be one of the most scalable, if not the most scalable. So if it's already hand handling the, the transactional volume of Visa and more, uh, who knows how much more volume it could handle. Uh, once this merge and future hard forks uh, occur moving forward. So yes, I'm, I'm uh, an ETH maxi for those reasons and uh, I do see it actually flipping Bitcoin's market cap uh, because it in effect solves the blockchain trilemma and that's why cryptocurrencies exist. Okay, thank you very much for that. And just before you go, any cryptos we should be keeping on our watch list as we enter the second half of this year? I knew there was something you'd want at the end of this. So, um, yeah, there are a couple that I'm keeping my eye on. Obviously, I want to avoid um, anything relating to financial advice. However, um, a, a couple of cryptocurrencies I'm keeping my eye on are, uh, are GMX. Now, that's a, a decentralized derivatives exchange that pays fees to its holder. Another one is Matic or Polygon. Now, that is um, building scaling solutions for Ethereum and, and, and was one of the first to deploy a, a zero knowledge roll up. So you want to look for projects that, that complement the Ethereum ecosystem moving forward. Uh, another one is Synthetics SNX. That's one of the first players in the DeFi space and, and following DeFi. Chainlink is another one you'd want to keep an eye on. That is the largest Oracle provider in all of crypto, which is a very important infrastructure that allows additional protocols to operate. Lastly, and, and following um, our talks of the NFTs and, and metaverse, I'd be keeping an eye on Mana, Decentraland, and uh, sorry, Decentraland, and Engine E N J. They are ETH-based metaverse coins, and, and obviously need no introduction. Following the um, the, the previous talks, and uh, as the metaverse keeps expanding, and, and big companies such as Meta plan on establishing yourselves, uh, themselves in this metaverse, Mana and Engine are, are really sort of setting themselves up properly to um, to benefit from this moving forward. So those would be the cryptocurrencies I keep an eye on. Uh, Ethereum would be the, 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 the most prominent of those five or six that I've mentioned. And then you do want to participate with some exposure to altcoins. However, um, the, the majority of your of your portfolio should be allocated in the more established cryptocurrencies such as such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Thanks so much, Griffin, for making time to appear on the show today. And as the bear does continue to swoop on the markets, uh, hopefully we're seeing all this institutional investment going into these coins and building up some great use cases for these crypto projects that hopefully we'll see in due time some excellent traction. I think the crypto market cap globally did increase today, so that's good news for people who are interested in the sector. Was there anything you'd like to add before you go? Yeah, buy, buy low, sell high. That's as, <laughs> that's as far <laughs> as the adage goes. Uh, as more and more institutions get into this space, 
uh, they will want cheaper prices. So use this time in the bear market to, uh, to learn how to trade, uh, understand the fundamentals underpinning the market. You will have plenty of time. And um, as far as the market cycles go, you, you do have the benefit of the Bitcoin halvening cycle that occurs every four years. Uh, we had the most recent one in, in 2020. The next one is scheduled for 2024. So you have at least two years to understand this market, uh, observe prices as they go through this bear market, providing better buying opportunities and really set yourself up to, uh, to benefit from that next halvening cycle, which will occur in 2024, 2025. Thanks so much, Griffin. Enlightening definitely was a word that sprung to mind during that discussion and really do appreciate your time. Likewise, thank you so much for having me here today, Sage. And if you just joined us, we had a very informative, stimulating discussion with Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder at Cluster. That's Q-L-U-S-T-E-R, if you're wondering. And you can catch the full interview at Calkine Media's YouTube channel. Please keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. Kathy Wood gives up portfolio manager of two ETFs. According to a regulatory filing, ARK Invest founder and CEO Kathy Wood gave up her role as portfolio manager of two exchange traded funds. The part will be taken up by the investment management firm's William Schreer, who has been primarily responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the fund's portfolio since September 2022. According to the US Securities and Exchange Commission filing, Wood has stepped back from the position with the 3D print ETF and ARK Israel Innovative Technology ETF. William Shearer now serves as portfolio manager of the index funds. He started as a trading manager at ARK Investment Management and has been employed by the firm since 2014. The reason for Cathy Wood leaving the role of portfolio manager for two ETFs is not yet known to the public. Launched in 2017, the ARK Israel Innovative Technology ETF, IZRL, is an index fund that tracks the price movements of exchange-listed Israeli companies. The advisory firm is known for its actively managed products. However, the ARK Israel Innovative Technology ETF is one of ARK's few passive products. The exchange-listed Israeli companies are into disruptive innovation in the areas of genomics, healthcare, biotechnology, industrials, manufacturing and the internet and information technology. It has net assets of a total of $115.4 million. Launched in 2016, 3D printing ETF, PRNT, is an index designated to track the price movements of stocks of companies involved in the 3D printing industry from the US, non-US developed markets and Taiwan. It has net assets of total $196.7 million. In February 2022, ARK Invest reported in a regulatory filing that the firm would invest in disruptive innovation through a new fund targeting illiquid securities, including private companies. Wood, known for managing ARK Innovation, the firm's flagship exchange traded fund, filed for an interval fund that would expand the firm's reach to allow it to invest in disruptive innovation. In securities of firms that might not have have a secondary market, the filing said. So billionaire investor Kathy Wood founded ARK Investments Management 
and registered the firm with the US Securities and Exchange Commission in January 2014. And last year in March, shares of ARK Space Exploration and Innovation ETF, another ETF by ARK Invest, failed to lift off in their Wall Street debut. And according to its prospectus, the exchange traded fund focuses on companies related to orbital and suborbital space, enabling technologies and those that stand to benefit from aerospace activities. Other ETFs run by ARK Investment Management focus on genomics, autonomous cars and financial technology. Now if you like this information please give it a like, share it and comment on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. But for more articles head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. This is Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. The Global Registry is the first open source database that tracks global reserves and output of oil, gas and coal, expressed as CO2 equivalent. The Registry intends to increase understanding of extraction consequences on the remaining carbon budget and ultimately to assist decision makers management of it through enhancing openness and accountability surrounding fossil fuel output. Now to coincide with the climate negotiations taking place at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, a first of its kind database for tracking the global production, reserves and emissions of fossil fuel was launched on Monday the 19th of September. According to recently released data, burning and producing the world's reserves would result in more than 3.5 trillion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than seven times the carbon budget still available to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and more than all emissions generated since the Industrial Revolution. The Global Registry of Fossil Fuels made the discovery. Oil, gas and coal demand and consumption reduction have been the main goals of climate change policy initiatives to date, but the availability of these fuels has been neglected. For instance, the Paris Agreement makes no mention of the production of fossil fuels, despite the fact that they are responsible for more than 75% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. The United Nations Environment Programme's Production Gap Reports have established the fact that there is a significant fossil fuel overhang relative to the remaining carbon budget and the International Energy Agency has demonstrated that no new fields can be developed and that some existing fields must be retired early if they are to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, markets are unable to identify the assets that are most likely to become stranded, and policymakers and civil society do not have the asset level data necessary to influence management decisions throughout this phase out. The registry has data for more than 50,000 fields in 89 countries at the launch, accounting for 75% of global production. It demonstrates, among other things, that even if all other nations immediately stopped producing fossil fuels, the US and Russia each had enough fossil fuel reserves to exhaust the whole global carbon budget. The Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia, which generates over 525 million tonnes of carbon emissions annually, is the most significant source of emissions out of the 50,000 fields listed by the registry. Of course, information other than emission statistics will be required by governments to address the issue of how to reduce the oversupply of fossil fuels. The registry will gradually expand to include economic characteristics such as taxes and royalties related to certain assets. 
that might be considered when deciding how to manage a phase out of supply. With that, we come to the end of this video. Don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button, and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. Blue chip stocks represent fundamentally strong companies. Let's take a look at two of the most prominent ones listed on the ASX and zoom in on their current performance. Now, the first one on the list is Macquarie Group, which comes in under the diversified financial groups. Macquarie provides services in banking, financial, advisory investment, and funds management segments as well. The key operations range through segments that include Macquarie Asset Management, Corporate and Asset Finance, Banking and Financial Services, Macquarie Securities Group, Macquarie Capital, and then Commodities and Financial Markets as well. The company unveiled its last piece of a price-sensitive announcement on the 28th of July this year, which was its annual general meeting report. Macquarie reported that elevated volatility and commodity prices contributed to strong results across the commodities platform, driven by trading and client hedging opportunities. The company's shares were priced at around $172, down by 0.087%. On a year-to-date basis, they were down 18.2%, however, as of the 20th of August. Moving on to West Farmers from the retailing sector. The group has a diversified set of business operations across all verticals, including supermarkets, liquor, hotels, convenience stores, home improvement, office supplies, department stores, and more. The company unveiled its full year results for 2022 on the 26th of August, stating that it maintained significant balance sheet flexibility during the year to support continued investment across the group. It also announced a fully franked ordinary final dividend of 100 cents per share, taking the full year ordinary dividend to 180 cents. West Farmer's shares on the 20th of September were priced at around $46.04, up by 1.32%. Then on a year-to-date basis, they were down around 23% as of the 20th of August. Now they're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Hi there, I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us. Please do hit the subscribe button and keep watching to find out more. The cost of living in Australia has jumped with official inflation data hitting 7% in the year to July and 6.8% to August. The main drivers of the inflation rate reported by the Australian Bureau of Statistics or ABS were construction costs, petrol and food. 
The cost of building a new home rose 20.7% while petrol prices grew by 15%. But the cost of food and non-alcoholic beverages up close to 9.3% as well. This is the first time the ABS has reported inflation data monthly, with all previous results coming out quarterly. The ABS statistician David Gruen explained that the slight fall in the annual inflation rate from July to August was primarily due to a fall in prices for automotive fuel. Please like, comment and subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell icon for future notifications. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai. You might think that crypto investors have had a rough go of it with plummeting prices since last November, and you'd be correct. The crypto market cap has lost over two thirds of its value since peaking late last year. And with looming macroeconomic pressures, the days of crypto being a safe haven asset to store money seem to be long gone. However, this doesn't mean that you can't make money with crypto right now. One method used is called scalp trading. And although it's a volatile terrain, it's a way for traders to earn quick rewards if done correctly. Bear in mind though, this is a very risky strategy and it should only be attempted by experienced traders. Crypto scalp traders use technical chart analysis to buy at the bid price and then sell at the asking price, a process called creating a spread. In this game, minutes and even seconds count as traders aim to capitalize on the short-term volatility, which is typically inherent to the value of most crypto tokens. Within this trade landscape, there are various strategies like range trading, wherein traders look for trades to close inside predetermined price ranges and arbitrage, where traders buy and sell the same asset in different marketplaces to get the best profit possible. Now this type of trading is by no means easy and requires intense attention and intimate knowledge of the market. And while the risk is generally lower due to the smaller position sizes involved, the fast paced nature means that losses can add up quickly. And in other words, this isn't a strategy for the faint of heart. Let us know what you think. Have you used this strategy and did it work for you? Leave your comments below and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon. I'm Molly Shields for Calcine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. 
Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Let's explore in this video. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. Please subscribe to the channel. Exports are goods and services produced in one country and sold to buyers in other countries. Exports, together with imports, add up to international trade. The country manufacturing and selling a product is called an exporter, while the products it delivers to other nations are called exports. After six quarters of sustained growth, the value of international merchandise trade for the G20 reached a new high in the first quarter of 2022. Exports increased by 3.6% as compared to the fourth quarter of 2021. The increase is largely due to rising commodity prices as the war in Ukraine and COVID-19 pandemic measures in East Asia placed more pressure on the prices of traded goods and already strained supply chains. According to Statista, in May 2022, the Merchandise Exports Index, which is the US dollar value of goods, sold to the rest of the world, stood at 215.66, excluding the United States. And this is compared to the United States index value of 158 in the same month. The index was highest in emerging economies, reaching an index score of over 350. According to World Population Review reports, China tops the list of exports of goods and services with an export value of 2.72 trillion US dollars, followed by the United States with an export value of 2.12 trillion US dollars. In third place comes Germany with an export value of 1.67 trillion US dollars. And according to the Observatory of Economic Complexity data in July of 2022, China exported $333 billion. The top exports of China were computers, telephones, integrated circuits, semiconductor devices and electric batteries. Now, meanwhile, in July 2022, China exported mostly to the United States, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea and Vietnam. Tensions in the US-China economic relations have increased business uncertainty in 2020 and 2021 as the US is the country's main trading partner. Similar tensions exist with Australia, though with lesser ramifications for China. However, the Chinese government is pursuing looser economic policies to diminish the increasing risks to future growth. The United States Census Bureau and the US Bureau of Economic Analysis on September 7th announced that the goods and services deficit was $70.6 billion in July, down by $10.2 billion from $80.9 billion in June. And meanwhile, July exports were $259.3 billion. That's $0.5 billion more than June's exports. So according to the Observatory of Economic Complexity, data for June 22, the top exports to the United States were refined petroleum, crude petroleum, petroleum gas, aircraft parts and commodities, not elsewhere specified. And meanwhile, in July 2022, the US exported mostly to Canada, Mexico, China, Japan and the Netherlands. The cyberspace enhanced logistics channels, free trade agreements, e-commerce and the array of accessible export supports through the US government and its partners have made exporting more feasible for the United States. U.S. export prices increased 18.2% from June 2021 to June 2022. Lastly, speaking about Germany, total German exports of goods grew by 13.4% to 763.9 billion euros in the first half of 2022, year on year. And meanwhile, exports to Russia fell by 34.5% to 8.3 billion euros in the first half of 2021 because of the war in Ukraine and the sanctions imposed on Russia. Germany's major export goods in the first half of 2022 were motor vehicles, trailers and semi-trailers, followed by machinery. In June 2022, Germany exported goods to a total value of 135.9 billion euros, an increase of 14.5% from June 2021. And according to the Observatory of Economic Complexity's latest trends, in April 2022, Germany exported mostly to the United States, France, Netherlands, Austria and Poland. 
Thank you for joining us on this report. Now, if you like the information, give it a like, share it, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. But for more articles, head to the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. This is Sage for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. The Australian government has called for Optus to pay for any new passports for those whose data may have been breached in the recent incident. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has written to the company to confirm whether they will pay for the new passports, adding that Australian taxpayers should not have to foot the bill. A new 10-year adult passport costs around $308, while a 5-year one is $155. There's already a rather hefty backlog of Australians requesting new passports following the pandemic, and with the Australian Passport Office reportedly receiving about 15,000 passport applications per day, even prior to the Optus hack. Last night, the telecom giant said it would pay for those affected by the data breach to get the new $29 driving licenses in New South Wales. Meanwhile, the federal government is considering issuing a new Medicare cards as well to the millions of impacted customers. Let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe as well. Holly Shields here reporting for Calcine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkai Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Genus, a company started by an Aussie dad with a green app for kids that's been trialled in 40 schools. Today, I have with me the co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Welcome, John. Great to have you with us today. Thank you very much. So, John, could you tell us about Genus? What can you tell us about the app? Yeah, so we're addressing the most pressing issue of our time, you know, avoiding climate catastrophe. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're running out of time to save the planet. Unfortunately, our kids know this too. And they're a smart generation. They're highly engaged. They want to help, but they don't always know how. Plus, let's face it, sustainability has got a bit of an image problem. Kids see it as hard and boring or an adult problem. And uh, we basically want to change that. You know, so our app provides fun things for kids to do, online challenges, games, quizzes, that sort of thing. But the difference with Genus is that we send them out into the real world to perform real world missions that drive real world impact. This is about the kids saving the planet for themselves. It's about the future and it's about saving the planet for the generation with most at stake. Well, it sounds fabulous and very exciting for kids and parents also. Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, I was watching a documentary, a nature documentary with my kids, and there was a section about habitat destruction and climate change. And my kids asked me, why is it like this? And I answered that, you know, a lot of adults don't understand climate change and things like that, and some just don't care. 
And at that point, I was like, if the adults are like this, what chance do the kids stand? And at that point, we're, I was like, we've got to do something about this. The stakes are too high. So if we're going to engage kids in sustainability, you know, we need to make it fun. So I watched a, a TEDx talk about gaming to solve real world problems and all the pieces fell into place. You know, you've got to make it fun for them. They're a digital generation, so it's got to be online. So we introduced principles of gamification like awards, levels, competition, that sort of thing. But it has to mean something in the real world if anything is going to change. So we send them out to do these mini missions that have a positive impact on the planet. It's about rewarding the kids and it's about making it a positive journey. It's such an important issue of our time. Now, a recent survey by medical journal The Lancet of 10,000 children and other young people aged 16 to 25 years across 10 countries, and that was including Australia, found that 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change and 84% were moderately worried. So mm. what do you think about those figures? Well, it's clear there's a, a whole generation growing up worrying about the future of the planet. You know, as a dad, I'm not okay with that. You know, I don't want my kids growing up with this existential dread about the future. And that's exactly what Genesis is about. It's about giving them hope. It's about giving them agency. It's about showing them how they can take control and live more sustainably. So, yeah. Now, let's just talk about financials, if we can. Now, you have some raised plans. You're looking for around 800000 What do you expect to do with these funds? Uh, essentially, it's all about taking us to the next stage. You know, we've made a great start. We've built an engaging platform full of amazing activities and loads of curriculum-aligned resources for you know, teachers to apply lessons in school. Um, uh, but we need to develop our product even more. You know, we want to introduce things like Roblox and Minecraft and other metaverse applications, uh, and this takes money. Um, so we're, we're at the cutting edge of what kids want to do, but we need to keep ahead of the curve. Um, and also we need to develop the market. So we need to get uh, our brand out there, get our messaging out there, and invest in sales development and customer acquisition. Absolutely. So what are the future plans for Genesis? Are you looking to grow globally? Ultimately, yes. Australia is our launch market. You know, we're going to learn here, learn quick and then move fast. You know, ultimately, we want to make Genesis the biggest possible business. And, and this is for two reasons. Number one, you know, the more kids and families and teachers that use the platform, the greater and uh, the positive impact we can make. You know, the more kids that use Genesis, you know, the more the next generation is growing up thinking about and acting on behalf of the planet. And secondly, while the missions and activities, you know, are, you know target small scale personal acts of sustainability with enough kids on it, you know, this starts to become a systemic movement. This is generational change that we're targeting. So the bigger the business, the more impact we can have. And that's really what we're targeting. Sounds fabulous. Very exciting space to be in now. That was co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media, so make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai.
Hi there, Sage Vikal Khan Media with you. Chinese state-owned banks have been asked by Chinese central banks to sell dollars offshores in orders to accumulate its local currency. The move comes as China's central bank, the People's Bank of China, looks to slow down the devaluing of China's yuan, according to sources close to Reuters. China's central bank has told Chinese state banks to ask their offshore branches, including New York, London and Hong Kong, to review their holdings for the offshore yuan and ensure US dollar reserves are ready to be deployed. The move aims to put a floor under the yuan, which has declined more than 11% against the US dollar so far this year. The yuan's depreciation has raised concerns about domestic sentiment and potential capital outflows. The People's Bank of China did not respond immediately when asked by Reuters. Please give this article a like, comment or subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell icon for future notifications. Thanks for watching. This is Sage for Kalkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkine. The recent attack on telecommunication giant Optus gave way to a frightening data security crisis. About 40% of Australia's population has been affected by the situation and the issues are continuing. Some experts have even pointed out that this might be the biggest data breach in the country's history. The leaked information includes date of birth, names, phone numbers and in some cases addresses and driver's license numbers. The company looked into the possibility of unauthorized access to customer information. And according to Optus's announcement, its most affected current and former customers will obtain a free 12-month subscription to the credit monitoring and identity protection service Equifax Protect. The company's announcement highlighted that the most affected customers will receive direct communications from Optus over the coming days on how to start their subscription at no cost. In light of this issue, let's have a look at how some of the telecom companies are faring on the ASX. First one is Telstra. Telstra Corporation is a telecommunication and tech company which provides telecommunication and information services to millions of customers. Segments of the company include Telstra Enterprise, Telstra Interco, Networks, IT and Telstra, Consumer and Small Business. The company shares were trading in the green on September 29th. The shares were priced at around $3.88 and then on a year-to-date basis, the company shares were down around 8.6%. Moving on, TPG Telecom. The Australian telecommunications company offers internet, mobile and fixed line services to its customers, including residential users, small and medium enterprises and government, plus large corporate enterprises and wholesale clients. TPG Telecom shares were trading in the green on September 29th. The shares were priced at around $4.89 and then on a year-to-date basis, the company shares were down by around 17%. And the last one to have a look at is Spark New Zealand. Spark and its subsidiaries provide telecom primarily in New Zealand. The company shares were trading in the green on September 29th. Shares were priced at around $4.48. And on a year-to-date basis, Spark shares were up 3.7%. Now that you're up to speed, remember to hit that bell icon and subscribe as well to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, 
the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. After a year of sliding off of a list of the richest individuals in America, Donald Trump has returned, thanks to the unexpected success of his much derided social networking platform. The former US president's estimated net worth increased from 2.5 billion US dollars to 3.2 returning him to the Forbes 400 ranking at position number 343 despite a string of legal issues, including a recent $250 million civil fraud action in New York. A fresh wave of support from ordinary investors helped the shell company connected to Trump's media endeavor cement its position as the greatest market performer of its kind. And following the debut last week of the former president's social media network, Truth Social, traders flocked to Digital Wealth Acquisition Corp, the special purpose acquisition company. Truth Social became the most popular free program in the Apple App Store, which sent shares of DWAC soaring by as much as 17% before gains were paired. And on volume four times greater than the previous week, it increased 10% on Tuesday to reach its highest point in four months. At the day's conclusion, Warren's increased by 9% to 28.98. According to Bloomberg, there were issues with the app's launch, however, as some interested users could not sign up and others experienced errors. By 9.50 a.m., there were close to 400,000 people in line and others started tweeting screenshots of their waitlist numbers. According to Forbes, Trump Media and Technology Group is now Donald Trump's single greatest asset. More than 80% of Trump media and technology group is owned by Mr. Trump, hoping to go public by merging with a special purpose acquisition firm. Retail investors have expressed much support for the SPAC despite several obstacles, including federal probes and in the merger process. Let us know what you think and don't forget to like, share and subscribe as well and hit that bell icon for future updates. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Kelkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkai Media. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Lauren Ryder. She's the CEO, Leading Edge Global. When an organisation experiences rapid growth, there are many stakeholders who are affected and ensuring that all involved are prioritised is a complex task. Good change management is imperative in preventing disengaged employees and ineffective processes. So here to tell us more about the work they do is Lauren Ryder, CEO at Leading Edge Global. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Sage. I'm so glad you're free to share some of your insights with us. Let's jump straight in. Could you help us understand the mission behind Leading Edge Global and how does it feed into Leading Edge data centers? Sure. So Leading Edge Global transforms growing companies into market leaders. And we do this through our team of expert consultants who embed themselves in organizations to drive this change. 
And, and what we find is that there's a lot of eight-figure businesses out there who are still operating like six or seven-figure businesses, and they have outdated systems and processes and structures. And we run these digital transformation programs to create efficiencies across their business. Now, Leading Edge Data Centers happens to be one of our clients, and they are an amazing business. They are building and operating data centers across regional Australia to improve connectivity for regional Australians. So we were engaged to set up and run their customer experience and marketing function, and we continue to be engaged today. Wow, that sounds amazing. Sounds like a very, very valuable client to have. So, Lauren, what are the benefits of the changing work environment to hybrid these days, inviting more flexibility? You know, after two years of working at home, lots of employees are finding it difficult to return to work. They've set up their lives to be working at home. I don't think anyone's enjoying the new traffic or the long commutes. And I think do, people do really enjoy spending time with family. And businesses have proven that they can support people working at home. What I do find interesting is that there are businesses at the moment who are actually requesting that people come back to the office, stating that there's issues with culture or lower productivity. But interestingly, we've looked at some surveys and we found that that's not actually the case. That um, the businesses that are requesting people to come back full time are actually getting lower employee engagement survey results. They're finding people are burning out, there's attrition. And basically just the social and emotional needs are no longer being met. So I think the question really is, how can we effectively build hybrid into a long-term solution? And I do think a lot of businesses are, say, having certain days in the office, but the key is to really make use of that time, have creative solutions, run workshops, and, and really the, the areas where you need to use your brain and be in the room, do that. And I think the other thing that we really need to do is to support managers better. So managers, now that people are working from home, we need different onboarding, we need different types of training, different metrics and measurement and autonomy for managers to really cut through that red tape to help make right decisions. Because sometimes things about employees aren't really about the policies. We need to make decisions in real time. And I really think if we do that, then you know our managers will have the support they need and have better engagement with their employees. Thanks, Lauren, for sharing your insights there. I think they're trialling the four-day week in some organisations in Sydney at the moment. They were trialling it in the UK for a while, and I wonder if they will find if employees are more engaged and more productive in the four days that they come to work um, instead of the full five. That would be very interesting to see what changes could come out of that. Well, but we do have one client who does that, and yeah. they, they do fantastic. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, that's very, very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, cool. The other thing from what you were saying about having accessibility to employees and you know getting them to, into the workplace is not always the best option. Um, it must be difficult to work out the balance between like a matrix style business model or a divisionalized form, getting that um, you know balance worked out. Do you think it's possible to have a balance or do you think it has to be one or the other? Oh, I think you can absolutely have a balance and, and I think you need to be flexible and it depends on what the organization is and how the organization is working. Um, it really is about communication and working together. Um, I'm working within a really large organization now who um, they are matrixed um, in some ways and in some ways you would never know who somebody actually reports to because everybody works so well together. So I think the the key to that is having really strong leadership to make it really clear on what's actually required and how people are going to work together. Great, thanks so much. Just thought I'd throw that one in the mix. So how important is it to have employees engage with and be aware of the company's business objectives for purpose-driven brands in your opinion? Yeah, well, look, a purpose-driven brand really is motivated, motivated by their core mission. So the reason they exist is to solve a problem, meet a need in society. And what's cool about it is that their purpose informs the vision, the mission, the story, their visual identity, how they make decisions, basically everything. And one of my 
favorite um, purpose-driven brands is uh, Who Gives a Crap, which is a toilet paper business. But they're a B Corp and they actually donate their profit to building toilets and providing clean water around the world. But what's really cool is how that impacts their employees. So they're actually able to get the best talent from around the world and they provide them with real benefits. They give them, say, meeting free days and a lot of flexibility to take time off. And what that's done is that's given them a 91% on their culture survey, which is a very, very high result. So what we find is that employees of purpose-driven businesses are actually innately aware of their business objectives because they're woven through everything they do. So I think the question is, how can we get those same results for non-purpose-driven brands, you know, just everyday companies? And I think that the answer really is to embed those vision, mission and values across everything they do. And that's even the first thing when we embark on a digital transformation, we come in and we make sure that they have a really strong vision, mission and values. And I think you'll get the same results that way. Lauren, that was such a great example. I mean, the markets are, the, the financial markets, they're affected by sentiment and emotion, yet a lot of those businesses can be quite cold places to work where you are expected to come out res with results, and if you don't, there are consequences. And it's just, you know, it seems logical that en emotion is energy in motion, and you'd want to find the two work together. So what you gave us an example there was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. As we move on, what are the biggest barriers for businesses looking to transform digitally? How can change be managed without causing bottlenecks in workflow, in your opinion? Yeah, so look, if we look at transformation holistically, looking at a, uh, an, a overhauling a business model, there's sort of three key areas we look at. So we look at the people, the process, and the technology. So one would think in a digital transformation, the technology would be the hard bit, but it's actually the easiest bit. If we have the requirements right, we know what we're building, the technology is fine. Where we struggle during a transformation is in the process and the people. So with the processes, the key is to map the future state as accurately as we can. The challenge is so many businesses haven't even mapped their current state. So in order to get their future state, the best way to do that um, is to get everyone who is impacted into a room to do design those future state workshops. And an even bigger step is what we try and do is break that model. So we actually run examples all the way through. So for the processes, that's where we really find some bottlenecks, but that's how we solve them. The challenge really actually comes in with the people. And the fact is nobody likes change. And it's all really in our brains because our brains think that change is danger. Um, and they'll take the path of least resistance, which is basically not adopting the change. And if we don't adopt the solution, the transformation will fail. So some really important tips to get through a transformation with the least impact to business is first of all, having that strong sponsor, somebody who lives and breathes and embeds that change through everything they do all the way to the end. Um, the second thing I recommend is rolling out what we call leader-led change, which is by having all of the leaders in the organization roll the change out to their people. Um, a lot of times they don't have the skills to do that, and that's where we come in. We train them on how to lead change, and we mentor and coach them. And the final thing that we do to make a transformation effective is to co-create the solution. So bring as many people on board to actually um, design what the future state is going to look like and also have ongoing feedback to make sure that we always know exactly how we're doing. So those are tips for us to transformation success. Well, wow, thanks so much. Really like your style there. And I don't think people should be afraid to take a good, long, hard look at themselves and see what they can do better. But it's not always easy. You're so right. So as we wind up, it's been tumultuous times, inflation, the cost of living's rising. And in some cases, wages are matching up, but not always. Do you have any advice for those wanting to negotiate a pay rise with their bosses during these high inflationary times? 
Absolutely. Look, you're right. The cost of living is rising. So it's no wonder employees are wanting pay rise now. Um, inflation sitting what, around 6.1%, which actually has some serious impacts to people's lives and especially taking into account the interest, um, the increase in mortgage rates. So, you know, there's quite a few thousand dollars over the course of a year that people are impacted. So I think, you know, the first question we need to ask is, is it a good time to ask for a pay rise? And I'd say, look, absolutely. I think it's probably always a good time to ask, but do keep in mind that businesses are actually feeling the same pressures that we are. So what you have to do is be ready to have a negotiation and to handle the situation maturely and calmly. So the idea is to come prepared and come into the discussion really asking the right way. Um, I think the second question really is, how much should we ask for? Now, you might be tempted to ask for the full 6.1%, but I think we really need to keep the big picture in mind. There actually has been about a 2.5% pay rise over the last two years. So just ask yourself, have you actually gotten a pay rise? Did you manage to keep your job during the pandemic? You know, if your business has already looked after you, factor that in. So. I think um, a lot of people prepare for a pay rise conversation based on merit and achievements. But this year in the current environment, it might actually just be a number for your business. So if you're looking at an actual number, I suggest going in for about the four to 5% increase mark. Look, don't take it personally, talk about the inflation, let them know how much you're out of pocket. And if you don't get it, don't take it personally. It's tough times for everyone out there. Great advice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. I really enjoyed our chat. Thanks so much, Sage. And if you've just joined us, we had an informative discussion with Lauren Ryder, the CEO at Leading Edge Global. To watch the full interview, please head to Calkine Media's YouTube channel and keep watching Calkine Media for more live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. The global risk of recession has had a negative impact on the Australian market. In a recent turn of events, ASX touched its three-month low. The market has already lost 12.7% since the beginning of the year. The Australian dollar, too, has been grappling with the wrath of the possibility of a recession. It has fallen to its weakest level in over two years. The recession is a macroeconomic phenomenon characterised by a dip in economic activity, a fall in aggregate demand, and soaring unemployment levels for an extended period. During a recession, the economy is bound to face sluggish retail sales, crushed consumer confidence, a dip in business sentiments, job losses, reduced manufacturing output and sales, with a decline in the nation's overall GDP. And looking at all the indices, it's been a difficult year for all sectors throughout 2022. All the indices analysing each ASX sector's performance are down except for utilities and energy. Like the utility index was only up by 0.023% daily, whereas in the past year the index witnessed a growth of 9.54% as of 29th September. Similar to the utility index, the energy index was up by 2.78% daily and in the past year it has witnessed a growth of 18.8%. 29%.
The technology index, one of the market's most important indices, suffered quite tremendously this year. If we look at its performance, it has drastically plummeted in the past year. 28.11% down. The financial index, too, has been riding in gloomier tones since the past year. It's been down by 10.60%. There are various factors contributing to this whirling phenomenon, be it the disturbance in Europe or the issues in the global supply chain. There are multiple factors contributing to the instability of the market. And in the 1960s, 70s, 80s and 90s, Australia witnessed the wrath of inflation. And still, despite the challenges, it has fared well. And another important factor to keep in mind is that currently the country has a strong job and economic growth number. Thank you for joining us on this report. Now, if you do like the information, please give it a like, share it, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. But for more articles, head to the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkine. Coffee giant Starbucks is finally entering the metaverse. Starbucks Odyssey is a web free experience that will launch in late 2022. The company's rewards members can buy and trade collectible limited edition NFTs to unlock new reward benefits and participate in the interactive activities to earn NFT digital badges known as Journey Steps. You can access the Starbucks Odyssey experience through the Starbucks Rewards app, and it doesn't require a virtual reality headset, plus users are not required to have a crypto wallet to buy or collect the NFTs. With this announcement, the coffee giant joins its rivals Chipotle, Wendy's and most recently Taco Bell, experimenting with interactive NFT trading and games in the metaverse. Patronix and Payments conducted a recent study on technological integrations in the restaurant business. The study discovered that 34% of millennials have engaged in virtual world activity and 20% were familiar with the metaverse. In addition to this, 38% of respondents who had already used digital channels said they would be open to making restaurant purchases in these circumstances. So how are restaurants using the metaverse to their advantage? Unsurprisingly, Chipotle, the virtual ruler, has already inaugurated a virtual eatery on Roblox. Players can roll burritos in the metaverse using Chipotle Burrito Builder to earn burrito bucks and redeem them for an entree ticket that you can use in the Chipotle app. This is the first time a company has allowed users to acquire and trade real-world goods for Roblox experiences. And with the introduction of the Wendyverse, a virtual eatery on Horizon Worlds, Wendy's has also joined the fray. On top of this, according to Restaurant Technology News, the VCR group is developing a non-fungible token restaurant that allows patrons entry by using these digital membership tokens. You can buy them online and then use them at the Flyfish restaurant in the real world. McDonald's, Applebee's, Panera Bread, Wingstop and Chuck E. Cheese are some of the eateries that have jumped on the Metaverse bandwagon. Can you see yourself using these restaurants in the Metaverse? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm Holly Shields for Calcane Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. 
with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Thanks for joining us on Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is on the list for the Forbes 30 Under 30 VCs, and Mahesh Velenki is his name, managing partner of Superlayer. Web3 is the new era of the internet that's set to empower users. $4 billion was invested in blockchain gaming in 2021, with $7 billion already reached for 2022. Superlayer, a Web3 venture studio, has dozens of new social token projects built on the RLY network. So here to tell us more about Engage to Earn, Play to Earn, and how social-powered blockchain could onboard millions of users to Web3 is Mahesh Velanki, managing partner of Superlayer. Welcome to the show, Mahesh. Hey, Sage. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you, and congratulations on your recent $25 million funding from Polygon. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. So they're joining the ranks of an already star-studded suite of investors, including Gary V, Mark Andreessen, and even Paris Hilton. So you're definitely mixing in the right circles. It's a fun, it's a fun group, and we're excited to have all these folks involved. Wow. So can we start with um, asking you a little bit about Superlayer's focus in Web3? Will it be blockchain play-to-earn games mainly? Web3, big or small, you know, the first thing I look for is, uh, that I recommend is, is looking for somebody with any existing Web3 experience at relevant projects. And this is, of course, very hard to find as a small, you know, it's a small group of people right now. But, um, you know, if, if you can find somebody with relevant uh, experience uh, in crypto, uh, that's fantastic. If the candidate has no Web3 experience, it's just looking for somebody who has a really strong curiosity and personal passion. Um, and ideally an active user or participant in many different crypto communities already. Uh, I think that is, that's the next best thing. Um, and then, you know, I think it's just the industry, crypto just moves even faster than the regular technology industry. And so it's just important to like be able to learn incredibly quickly by looking around at the market, just understanding what other projects are doing and what makes them interesting and where, where things are headed. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, everything we look for is role specific, you know, can they do the, the job and do they have the skills required for the you know, particular role that they're, that they're interviewing for. Thank you so much for your insights, Mahesh. I suppose the open nature of blockchain projects allows for a lot of creativity and innovation. So I guess that's what you'll be looking for as well, people who know where to source that info and, and do what they know how to do with it. Absolutely. It's a wild, wild west, you know, out there sometimes. And so uh, finding folks who are really scrappy and can just figure things out is always a plus. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I found that so valuable. Really appreciate you joining Expert Talks today. Pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Take care. So if you just joined us, we had a very interesting, informative discussion with Mahesh Valenki. He's the managing partner of Superlayer. If you missed any part of that or want to watch it again, it'll be available on Calcine Media's YouTube channel. Keep watching for more live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage from Calcine Media.